All right. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here for the final installment of the Arkansas Native Plant Society Summer 2023 webinar series. We're very excited to have Theo Witzel for a special two hour program today on the results of the natural inventory that the uh, Natural Heritage Commission recently conducted for Benton and Washington counties. A uh, recording of today's program will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, I encourage you to go on there and view all of our other webinars that we've hosted over the years. Uh, you'll find this one uh, probably later today, uh, as well as everything we've uh, been providing going all the way back to the, uh, the pandemic 2020. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can go to uh, our website. That's ANPS.org. Uh, joining is pretty simple. You can just go on there, say, uh, type in ANPS.org slash join. Uh, it'll give you some details of where you can mail a check into, or you can even use your PayPal account to join online today. As I mentioned, our speaker today is Theo Witzel, ecologist and chief researcher for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Theo is the co-author of Trees, Shrubs, and Woody Vines of Arkansas, which is an excellent resource on the woody plants of our, the natural state. He's also co-editor of the Atlas of the Vascular Plants of Arkansas and has authored or co-authored more than 40 scientific publications and book chapters. Theo also serves as a regional reviewer for the Flora of North America project. So without further ado, I'd like to hand, uh, uh, hand it over to Theo for his program. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Theo. Thanks, Eric. It's my pleasure. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off just to save the bandwidth for the... Um, for the uh, audio, so I'm on a Wi-Fi connection. Well, I thought I was. I'm not sure it'll let me. Um, I can try to turn it off. I think I might be able to do that. It's yeah. all right. Uh, okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, it, I just got to start with a disclaimer here that it would take at least a full day to present everything uh, about this project. This is a massive project. It is the largest uh, research project that the Natural Heritage Commission has ever conducted um, as sort of a single contained unit. Uh, it started four years ago. Uh, it was originally gonna be a three-year project and then we had the pandemic and that really changed things up uh, in how we went about this and also when we were able to do field work, that sort of thing. Everybody's familiar with the disruption that that caused. Um, anyway, I'm and I'm not just going to talk about plants today, which is, um, in my mind, a plus, because um, I have learned so much from this project about all the other things out there, and uh, I'm going to talk a lot about those. And uh, you're going to see hundreds and hundreds of incredible photographs. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the, the funder of this project. It was a 50-50 a joint um, funding venture between the Walton Family Foundation and the Department of Parks, Heritage, Tourism, Arkansas Heritage, or Department of Arkansas Heritage and um, the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. And I'm not the only author of this thing. I have to send out acknowledgements to all of the uh, people who wrote this is basically a book length. It's going to be like a book, a book length report. Um, and you could consider like different chapters in this book as prepared by all of these different individuals. Many of these folks were hired on contract because they're experts in their particular group of organisms or habitats or whatever uh, it was that they did for the project. And um, and others of them sort of did this as part of their professional work at partner agencies or organizations, uh, donated their, their time or it was subsidized uh, by their employer. So we have a lot of partners uh, on this project. And just, just I'm going to go through these briefly, uh, just read everybody off here. Uh, the BIRDS account uh, for the biodiversity inventory was uh, conducted by Dan Scheiman of Audubon Delta, Fishes by Dustin Lynch of the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Mammals was done by Matt Conyer of the Northwest Arkansas Community College. Reptiles and amphibians were jointly uh, treated by uh, Corey Roberts and J.D. Wilson. Karst and cave obligates by Mike Slay of the Nature Conservancy. Crayfishes by Dustin Lynch and Brian Wagner. Mussels and clams by John Harris. 
enhanced by Shelby Grice, Joe Von Hill, and Joe McGowan of the Mississippi Entomological Museum. Bees by Coleman Little and Nalindra Joshi from the University of Arkansas. Butterflies, Moths, and Skippers by Shelby Grice, Joe Von Hill, and Joe McGowan. Grasshoppers by Joe Von Hill. Spiders by Ray Fisher. Sponges by me. Um, not a big group, but I was really excited to learn we have freshwater sponges in Arkansas. And in fact, some of them apparently are, are rare, um, new, new for me. Um, vascular plants, which is of course my expertise, I prepared jointly with Molly Robinson. Uh, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts, the bryophytes by Scott Schutte of the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. Macro fungi by Jay Justice, lichens by Doug Ladd, and spiders is on there twice. Um, other invertebrates of conservation concern were prepared by um, Kevin Crager and myself. Kevin is the new conservation biologist for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. And then the report is going to have sort of a section that acknowledges the groups that were not included in this inventory. And, um, you know, that was a kind of a frustrating uh, part of it to acknowledge that we weren't able to do all of the invertebrates, but of course, no one is. We weren't able to do the, the, the bacteria of the county, you know, you have to draw the line at some point where there's um, resources and where there's knowledge. And uh, these are the main groups that, that were explored for this biodiversity inventory. Uh, it was really inspired by two different, um, but sort of similar things. One was a system of countywide natural heritage inventories that have been done over several decades by the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program is by comparison, very well funded and staffed uh, compared to Arkansas. And they have done these sorts of things, although not really not near as in depth as we did. These are two year projects. Uh, they do do some field work, but it's primarily using known data, which is different than the way we approached it. Uh, and, and they look for sites of conservation significance sort of that are already known within these counties and bring them to the attention of decision makers, um, municipal leaders, corporations, whoever you know might be funding or planning for conservation in these counties. And they've actually done all the counties in Pennsylvania twice. Uh, and I, I think they're on their third round now with some of the more rapidly developing counties there. Uh, we ended up adding a very major component to to ours that was really inspired by what's known as the all tax of biodiversity inventory. And Smoky Mountains National Park is not the only place that's done this, but it's kind of the, the big high profile project uh, that's been going on for, I think about 30 years now uh, in, this, in our region. And um, what they did there is, is really set out to document all the species in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And it's quite impressive what they've done. They've, uh, this, they have a website that keeps like a daily update, you know, or I don't know, maybe it's weekly, but it, it tallies what they've found in that project over the, pro over the lifespan of, of the work. And um, you know, these are the numbers here. They found over 21,600 uh, species in the park. And of course, that's everything from bacteria and, and mildew and things you can barely see on up to uh, megafauna and uh, everything in between. Um, about half of that, over half of that, was new to the park uh, based on when they started the project. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, and then over a thousand species were new to science. Of course, a lot of those were microbes and things like that. Uh, we did not have the luxury to go to that level, but we did um, do quite a bit of work and I'll show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just leak the results here in a second as far as species numbers um, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, but just a little background on the components of the inventory that we're that we did, um, sort of combining those two uh, approaches that inspired the work. Um, it's basically a seven-part uh, report that's going to be going to be released. It's got um, an introductory section with just some basic background, executive summary, and things like that. There's a lengthy section on natural history and ecology, and that is everything about the the county that's that's known that would influence the biodiversity. So it's things like the geology, the landforms, the ecoregions, the soils, the climate, um, the hydrology, all of those things that sort of set the stage. 
for everything that lives there. Then there's probably the, the biggest section of the report are these species group level uh, species summaries, this biodiversity summary. So these are annotated species lists and I'll show you what they look like. Um, and they go back to basically as far back as we can go in, in modern times, I guess you'd say, like to the, the time of, of Euro-American record keeping that we have access to. And, uh, and we include everything in that. So that would include everything from bison, which were there up until the 1830s, um, to um, you know, everything that's still there today that we could find. But it doesn't include things, you know, like saber-toothed cats or whatever that, that are, were gone long, long ago. Um, we have a section on elements of conservation concern. So smart conservation sets targets, and those targets are typically the species that we've identified as the things that are rarest and, and most in need of, of protection, species and natural communities or habitats. And so that uh, gets a special section. Then there's a section on conservation challenges and threats. And these are things that might be obvious to people that do what I do every day, uh, people in the Native Plant Society, but they may not be so well known to the general public or to policymakers or uh, municipal leaders, people like that. So uh, this is, there are species level threats or species group level threats described in, the, in part three, but then this is sort of a general summary section of that. Then there's a section on conservation strategies, how to strategically and intelligently go forward um, with conservation action, conservation planning in a way that is, you know, going to get the biggest bang for the buck, do the most good, keep these species on the landscape uh, in time to come. And then there's a section on sites and habitats of high conservation value. This sort of goes in hand in hand with that part number six. And then, you know, this was when we when we started the project. These were the groups we thought we would be able to do these tier one. Uh, vascular plants, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, you know, so, so many of the, well, we did all of these. Then we had sort of a second tier that we thought if there's funding uh, and we can find an expert because not all of these groups have just a ton of experts, um, we would go to those. And then there's actually a, a tier three uh, level of on down. Um, and the report will have everything that was done and then everything that wasn't. Uh, so it was there. Here's sort of the, the leaking of the, of the results. And um, you can see pretty impressive tally for two county area. Um, I got to say that's almost 5,200 taxa. And when you realize we didn't do most of the insect groups, um, we just didn't have the funding and the expertise and time. Uh, it's pretty impressive. That's a lot. And this is the breakdown here um, of the groups that were, these are all the groups that were done, which I've already mentioned. Um, we'll come back to this. Just wanted to sort of throw that out there. Screen is not responding. Just give me a second. Okay. And then I want to show you kind of what, what sections of the report look like. And I don't have time to go through all seven sections, but I will focus on the ones I think are going to be the most interesting uh, to the audience. Uh, and a big part of that is that section on the species level biodiversity summary. So each of the groups that all of the experts I mentioned worked on um, get basically like a little chapter. So they, they all have similar, but not, we, we didn't want to force people to all have a cookie cutter uh, thing. It is pretty standardized, but for example, bees have certain issues or certain threats or certain things about their life history that mammals don't. So they needed the flexibility to build that into their account and have maybe a section on social behavior, uh, which is important, or nesting behavior or seasonality that some of the other species groups didn't have. So um, Coleman and uh, Dr. Josie prepared this and they you know, went back through, all of these went through multiple rounds of edits with uh, myself and, and Molly Robinson, who's kind of the main editor uh, working on this project. And um, we, you know, made comments, sent them back, reworked things, uh, but they all sort of were edited for, for flow and, and readability and grammar, and, you know, all the basic things you would expect, uh, but also sort of vetted for standardized methodology. 
And, uh, you know, there's, so here's some of the major sections. There's an overview. There's a section on data sources and gaps where they were supposed to say, uh, this is where we got the information for our species list that we provided. Um, you know, you should know that bees are not well known. Uh, there's major data gaps in this group. Um, or maybe there's been a lot of collecting in a certain season, but not much in others. Or this particular group of ground nesting bees is not well known or, or whatever it, it might be. And then they had their own sort of little uh, subsections in this one. And there's the section on threats. There's a section on sites and habitats of high conservation values for bees. They might touch on uh, certain sort of insect specific or bee specific things like uh, pesticides uh, has, a, has a section in, in the bee, bee chapter. And then there's a section with the references that they use. So anybody who's interested in learning more can seek that out. Uh, then there's the annotated species. List. So this isn't the one for bees, it's the one for mammals. I'm just trying to mix it up a little bit. Um, there's a standardized uh, listing here uh, or the way that it's formatted, standardized format. Uh, it's very visual in that it's it's coded. There's these symbols that mean different things, whether a species is, is invasive or non-native. Uh, sometimes we don't know it's uncertain native status. Uh, is it rare? Is it of official conservation concern? Is Does the author think, even though it's not officially on the heritage tracking list or whatever, um, maybe they, they know that, well, this is really declined or we only have one record of this. We let them um, designate things as potential concern. That's the little P symbol. Um, if it's only known historically 30 years old or older for most groups, uh, we consider that of historical occurrence. No one's seen it or it hasn't been documented uh, in recent times. Uh, it gets a historical designation. And then they're organized by whatever standard organization method is standard for that group. So in, in, um, in mammals, they do it by order. So they're organized by order and then alphabetically by family and scientific name within that. Um, and this is just kind of the basic way it looks. And then, and then within, for every species that's listed, it's, you know, it's got scientific name, it's got, we use common names wherever possible. A big part of this uh, report we wanted it to be accessible. So tried to avoid being real technical, a lot of jargon. We actually have a glossary. We try to define uh, technical terms in common language. And then each species is given with its conservation status rank. That's this G, and then it'll be G followed by a number and then S followed by a number. And these are standardized um, status ranks about how vulnerable or rare a species is. Uh, the G is the global rank, so range wide, how's it doing? It's a, it's a one to five scale. Uh, although if it's extinct, it gets a GX, or if it's historical, known only historically globally, it would get a GH. And there's a legend in the report that will have explanations of all the codes. But these are standardized codes. They're uh, assigned by staff of the natural heritage programs around the country. And the global ranks are assigned using all of the state ranks, the S ranks, at the global level or range-wide level by NatureServe, which is a, uh, I guess, really sort of Western Hemisphere-wide um, umbrella group for all the heritage programs. And then um, some of them will have little special notes, or like uh, the second species listed here, the Ozark big-eared bat. It's listed as a species of greatest conservation need by the Game and Fish Commission, and it's endangered under the federal endangered species legislation. Um, this is, and then there's this, just look at this figure here. There's the Latin scientific name, the common name, the conservation status rank. Then it would say what ecoregions, and these are abbreviated, and there's a legend. I'll talk about ecoregions in just a minute, but it gives the ecoregions that it's known from within the county. And then there's a voucher, is what we call the documentation for each county. So BENT is Benton County abbreviation, and then Ward 4-17 at UARC, uh, that is a, a herbarium specimen in this case, this is a plant, and it's, there's an actual specimen in the museum at the University of Arkansas, and it's Ward is the collector, and it was Ward's collection number 4-17, and then in parentheses, the museum or herbarium or whatever where that is deposited. 
uh, Washington County and there's a nun specimen, this number, it's a UR. So that's, you know, we didn't want to just have, yeah, we heard it was in the county. Uh, we're going to put it on the list. It's really a high level of um, documentation required uh, for something to be on these lists. And doesn't have to necessarily be a museum specimen. We started some big eye naturalist projects, which many of you are probably familiar with and have contributed to. Uh, not all species can be 100% identified from a photograph, but others can. And so the experts that prepared these groups uh, treatments, you know, looked at the iNaturalist observations and if they thought it was a good enough photograph or it showed what was needed, they, they could accept that as a voucher. And then uh, we did allow expert observations. Uh, if it was the hired expert or someone that they uh, recognized as an expert, if they had, there's a very much a minority of the instances, but there are are a few things that were added because of expert observation. Um, here is more of the, uh, the mammal account, but the species of concern section really is gonna be one of the most important ones for conservation implications or, or its usefulness in conservation. So these are pretty detailed accounts of all the species of concern. So these are ones that are uh, either on the official heritage rare species list for Arkansas, uh, or ones that the author of the section thought was a potential concern, uh, or ones that were on like the game and fish species of greatest conservation need list. And um, here's just examples of some of the links of these. Here's the detail. Uh, here's a couple of really rare bats. You may know most of the bats are in rough shape. Um, long tail weasel, mountain lion, uh, you know, all of these are of concern and so, or of potential concern. And uh, they get a fairly detailed accounting here. And then another, excuse me, I'll take a drink of water. Another big uh, goal that we had was we wanted this to be a real visual report. So there are hundreds of these photo plates in this thing. And every species group that was treated has multiple photo plates, I'd say between three and eight photo plates, like full page plates like this. And, um, you know, they're grouped. We don't, of course, we don't treat every, we don't photograph or, or have photos of every species in the inventory. That would be impractical. That'd be too big. But we do try to focus on ones that were of concern, ones maybe that were rare uh, or just interesting, interesting looking, interesting stories. And they all have these captions and the captions vary between groups, but we really tried to make them um, of some detail. Like here's some of the fish ones. Uh, these are good, a lot of good detail in these fish photo plates and in the captions. Like for example, um, I guess we kind of, I was sort of inspired by like a National Geographic style caption where, you know, you might pick up the report and you might not be interested in reading all of the detail but you would look at the pictures and read those captions and still learn something interesting about the species but also be inspired to read more of the report um, so for example here it talks about paddlefish you know they're they're a species of large rivers um, it actually used to occur in the white river in northwest arkansas but after Beaver Lake was built, they were extirpated, uh, but they can survive in lakes. So they were reintroduced uh, to the lake. And obviously they're there now. You can see the size of the one in that photograph. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, interesting stuff about these different species in there. And just incredible photography. We really tried to um, get good photos. We, we loved to get photos from Benton, Washington County, and many of them are. We didn't always have them. So sometimes for rare species, we had a good photo from Carroll County or maybe even from Missouri or something like that. Well, we would use that um, as well. But all of these, this is gonna be a great resource for anybody who gets out into the areas and wants to, to know what they're seeing or keep an eye on or know what something rare looks like that they might be able to find it. Just a lot of pictures. 
Um, so I just want to show you kind of some of that first. We're going to see a lot more pictures from the accounts as we go through the report uh, or through some of the presentation here. Uh, but then I, I kind of want to backpedal back to that natural history and ecology section that sort of sets the stage because this really is a good summary and you know you can't necessarily do effective conservation planning or action just based on species presence. Some species move over large areas, animals are not always in the same spot, but you can really know a lot about the landscape and where the habitats are in the landscape um, based on the things I'm about to talk about. And this is really what we can gain a lot of traction with to, to do good conservation work is the knowledge in this section. Um, of course, Benton and Washington County are the northwestern most counties in Arkansas. About two thirds of Washington County is in the Boston Mountains, which is very different from the Ozark Plateaus in the rest of the counties. And I'm gonna talk a lot about ecoregions from here on out through the rest of the, um, the discussion here. Um, those ecoregions are split down into five smaller ecoregions, we call level four ecoregions within the two counties. In the Bostons, there's the upper and lower Boston Mountains, which just like it sounds has to do with how high they are. And then on those in the Ozark Highlands or Ozark Plateaus ecoregion, there's the Springfield Plateau, which is flat to gently rolling plains. Um, and then on where that's eroded down, you get the dissected Springfield Plateau, very different, very hilly, but the same geology. Uh, and then the White River Hills up around Devil's Eyebrow and that sort of in Beaver Lake uh, along the White River and the major tributaries. Very unique area over there um, with a lot of biodiversity that's not found in, in some of the other places. Uh, also, unfortunately, a lot has been lost, of course, because of Beaver Lake flooding the White River Valley pretty much throughout that entire ecoregion. Um, just a quick photo tour of these ecoregions. The upper Boston Mountains still has sort of the, the high plateau surface intact. So you look out, we call them the Boston Mountains. It's actually though a plateau that's been dissected. And you can look out across the landscape and all of the remnant, uh, all the ridge tops are the remnants of the old plateau surface. And the upper Boston's are the highest elevations in the counties. This is over 2,300 feet down in southeastern Washington County. And it's so high that it's cooler and rains more, has very different uh, forest types and things down in that area. Uh, I'll talk more about that as we go through. The lower Boston Mountains, lower in elevation, still that plateau, but more dissected. The geology's um, quite a bit different than up in the, in the high, uh, the upper Boston's. Um, and this is, occupies a larger area in Washington County as well. And then there's also, some remnants of the lower Boston's scattered across the Springfield Plateau up into the, uh, the Ozark Highlands. And they're not in the Boston Mountains ecoregions, but they are parts of the Boston Mountains and they have unique geology or not unique, they have Boston Mountain geology and Boston Mountain flora and fauna. So they're really um, add to the biodiversity of the plateau. And I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that as we go. The Springfield Plateau is that sort of plain, uh, that lower plateau. It's, it's lower than the Boston's, but it's also a plateau surface. And historically, it was largely savanna and prairie, and probably only closed forest along streams and, and little valleys um, on elevated remnants of the Boston's that sit up on top of it in places. And this is looking out south from uh, around Fayetteville, you see the Springfield Plateau in the foreground, although the prairies have almost all been destroyed, um, you can still see that sort of open landscape is still present. And then the more forested Boston's in the background. The White River Hill, oh, the dissected Springfield Plateau is that same surface, but very rugged and dissected by uh, streams and, and rivers. The White River Hills are sort of these chunky, large uh, ridges in, uh, in narrow hollows. And of course, that is the former White River in the background, this Beaver Lake. This is looking off of Trimble Mountain at Devil's Eyebrow, up near the Missouri border, looking south. And then this is another shot looking off of Whitney Mountain, uh, back towards Beaver Lake. And you can see it's kind of nice. There's snow on the ground. You can see the actual uh, surface of the land in the winter. 
under those trees, you see those sort of long, uh, big ridges. That's very different than the dissected Springfield Plateau and different geology as well. Uh, I love this particular uh, graphic that we made for the report because it shows a bunch of these ecoregions all uh, on this LIDAR image. And this LIDAR, if you're not familiar with it, is a, basically a, a laser scan of the, of, the, of the land and they're able to see through the forest. So this is the land surface that we're looking at uh, in this gray sort of silvery shaded map. And it shows with great precision um, the land surface. And it has been a game changer for ecology, conservation, anything to do with natural resources. Incredible, uh, the insight that we have from this and the things we can see uh, when you can see through the forest and see this, this detail. Uh, but you know, I've got them labeled here, the different ecoregions. You can see how different they look. The White River Hills with those big chunky blocky um, ridges and valleys, the dissected Springfield Plateau with those narrow dendritic drainages, the flat surface of the Springfield Plateau, and then some of those Boston Mountain outliers. These structures are called monadnocks, which are erosion resistant uh, sort of peaks or, or mesas that stick up. Uh, they usually have a, a steep slopes and a flat top, and they have a cliff or a steep area that sort of rims the, the top because there's a more resistant geology up top that forms that cliff line and the flat top. And I'll talk a lot more about those monadnocks because that's an important conservation target in the Springfield Plateau. Uh, this is that same view on a winter shot aerial infrared uh, or color infrared image. And this is another great um, tool for uh, conservation planning and allows you ecologists to see the vegetation. And it's important that it's taken in the winter because it allows you to see evergreen vegetation versus deciduous vegetation. You can tell a uh, winter green fescue pasture from a native prairie remnant. You can tell a pine plantation or a cedar encroached prairie or glade from a hardwood woodland or forest. Uh, and, and you can tell wetlands because uh, oftentimes they're, they're Soil is wet the time of year this is taken in the winter, um, but you can really see the landforms and you can see that a pattern here that the more forested portions of these landscapes are the more rugged portions, the more dissected portions. Uh, one of the big take homes about this project and about the information in these counties is that the Springfield Plateau, even parts of the Boston Mountains, historically much more open than it is today, the stuff that's still in natural cover. Um, there was a lot of prairie and savanna up there, um, more than just about anybody probably realizes. And this report's gonna shine a lot of light on that, uh, but it wasn't everywhere. There was natural forest. It was in the more rugged uh, landscapes, similar to what you see today. The geology, major driver of biodiversity. And we have a lot of information in the report that is gonna sort of explain how the geology influences the landscape, the vegetation, um, describe the geology, everything from soil structure to soil texture, uh, pH, chemistry, all of that's influenced by the geology, the landforms, how rugged it is, how steep it is, how flat it is, how long does the water stay, uh, the courses of the streams and rivers, all that's determined by the geology. Uh, this is the statewide ge geology map. And of course, when you're looking at a broad scale like this, you can't get too into detail. Uh, this is the geology from that statewide map. And these blue lines are faults, which are very important also, not only to the landforms, but also to the biodiversity, because along a fault, you might have much more complex geology, more types of rocks uh, from the two different sides of a fault. And that might totally influence more diversity in vegetation and of course species and everything else. Uh, so that's important. But in that sort of scheme, there's basically eight units mapped. And that's a very simplistic view of the geology. The geology is much more complex than that. There's probably about 24 different rock types that we recognize um, at a finer scale. But a lot of the, there's only maps for a few small areas in Benton, Washington County that really get down to a, a highly precise um, geologic map. 
This is a figure in the report. This is a stratigraphic column, which is a, a key to the geology, basically. And this was prepared by uh, another contributor to, to the report, the Office of the State Geologist, um, reviewed the content that we, we, we produced on the geology and provided uh, some help with figures. But this is the key to the geology. We had to actually split it. Um, it they, connect, they would connect vertically like this. And it's, it's a map of the rock types from the oldest ones at the bottom to the youngest ones up at the top. And uh, it has all the formation names, which have descriptions in the report and so on, and maps to show where they are. We also have a neat section that has a set of figures that sort of explain the relationship between the underlying geology and the landscape, the, the landforms. Uh, it's really a cool section. And you know, it talks about this, the sort of stair-step mountainsides of the Bostons and how that's formed by alternating layers of shale and sandstone in the Atoka Formation. Uh, it talks about where springs and seeps and caves form in the certain limestone uh, units up there. It talks about where the glades are found on certain dolomite geologies and shale geologies and so on. What rock types make the cliffs, um, which ones make the, the plateau surface, all of that's you know, really interpreted with these sort of numbered figures that have a paired image of the LIDAR and the geology of the same spot. And then it, it explains it all like that. It's pretty, pretty good stuff. And then also, you know, making this point over and over again that the geologic diversity is very strongly correlated with the biological. And here's some faults here on the right that sort of show um, basically along the fault, there's been a slippage of the, of the land and there's some of the faults have dropped. The geology on one side has dropped up to 400 feet in Washington County. And you might have totally different rock types on one side of the fault than you do on the other and totally different vegetation. So if you are wanting to buy a thousand acres, you had enough dollars to buy a thousand acres and you wanted to protect as many types of natural communities as you could. You know, if you bought a big chunk of the same stuff in the middle of the Springfield or the Boone Formation, which is the dominant geology up there, you know, you're liable to get so many different species and so many different natural communities. But if you were to buy a thousand acres straddling a major fault, you might have all kinds of complex uh, biodiversity. The geology influences a landform and the landform influences um, aspects of the climate and the weather. Uh, for example, that high Boston Mountains, upper Boston Mountains down in the south gets on average about nine inches of rain more than the drier grassland areas of the Springfield Plateau in Benton County. So it's a major difference. Um, also, so there's a whole section on weather and climate and, and you know, data presented in various ways. One of the neat things that a lot of people don't know, and I, I'm one of them that didn't know this, was that the summer is not the driest season in Northwest Arkansas. Actually, uh, the winter is the driest season. And uh, I would have thought it was the other way around. It's not evident because most of the vegetation's dormant that time of year. It's not sucking up water um, and you see a lot of water on the ground. And so on. it's actually one of the drier seasons in terms of precipitation, uh, maybe not in terms of water availability in the soil, but um, interesting. And then another interesting thing is the, the precipitation in Northwest Arkansas is bimodal. There's two periods of high rain in the year, in the spring and fall, and two of low in the winter and summer, uh, which influences the biodiversity for sure. Stream flow, um, all sorts of things. And then of course it's, it's changing. We have data on um, rainfall 60 to 30 years ago and, and rainfall 30 years ago to present. And the rainfall is increasing, and that's pretty obvious to anybody who watches the weather, but it, 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 it's borne out in the data. It's kind of interesting. Uh, temperature as well, very much influenced by the Boston Mountains. Uh, this is a, a map showing uh, temperature with the cooler temperatures and darker green there. And you can see there in, in the Boston Mountains and that southeastern part of Washington County, it's uh, cooler than it is elsewhere in the region. No big surprise. Here's a LIDAR map paired with a topographic map, sort of blended with the digital elevation model based on the LIDAR. And you can see uh, sort of the landform, and you can see those patterns again of the white areas, which are 
are open, not forested. And the uh, forested areas, which you know, are green on the topographic map on the right. And then uh, different sets of, of aerial imagery, aerial photography, very useful in this work that we did. Um, the one on the left is that color infrared winter image. It's uh, about 18 years old now, but it is still incredibly useful data set for uh, understanding vegetation and the ecology of these areas, much more so than just a regular um, non-infrared aerial photograph. Um, I guess one of the, the things I don't think I said was when, and you have a, the, the infrared image shows vegetation that's green when the photo was taken in, in shades of red and pink. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, you can see what's green at any time of year they've taken a picture. And you can see vegetation that's stressed out in the summer and that sort of thing. Um, this is another map of the uh, major watersheds. So these are the uh, Huck 8 watersheds, the hydrologic unit code number eight. So there's you know different levels of watersheds. These are the ones that the fish and crayfish and mussel data are, rather than given the ecoregions, which are not as important for aquatic organisms that live in rivers, it's really more useful to talk about the watershed that they're in versus the ecoregion. So uh, like fishes and mussels are presented in that way according to these uh, eight um, huck areas or watersheds. And then we have the, the creeks or major creeks are labeled here um, as well. The soils, uh, very interesting soil data available now. Um, unfortunately, at the county level, it's so complex that it's almost more than you can handle. Uh, so there's soil associations where these are sort of pared down. And we had some really, another collaborator on this, um, who's really working on a statewide, um, a statewide map of, of vegetation, of natural uh, land cover, basically. Uh, or some folks at the University of Missouri, part of something called the MORAP project. And they've been, they've been contracted with the Game and Fish Commission and the Natural Heritage Commission and the Highway Department and others. Uh, state agencies to produce a, a statewide map, very precise. And, and we got them to work on these two counties as a pilot. And uh, that's gonna be in the report as well, uh, sort of some draft maps. But these soils, they are so complicated in this map, they're very much correlated to certain landscape positions and certain geologic settings. Um, and we have some figures that sort of interpret that and show where you know, what does it mean if you have an Ender's uh, soil? What does that mean in terms of the landscape and the vegetation? Because all of that is correlated. And because of that, these folks at that MORAP project who, who made this soils, you know, they can aggregate the soils based on the vegetation or the natural communities that they support. And they get it down to a much smaller number. It's a little more manageable to do analysis with. And they can say, well, okay, these five soil types are really correlated with a Ozark acid shale woodland. And they can map, you know, use those soils as one component of many other data sets to make a vegetation map. And, and that's been done as part of this work. Uh, another thing they made is very cool solar radiation model. So this is done um, modeling how the sunlight, you know, the angle of the sun, how it moves through the day, moves through the seasons how it hits the land surfaces uh, with this high resolution LIDAR data set. And you know, it doesn't look like much out at the county level, but if you zoom in to a certain area, this is super informative to explaining what's on the ground. And what you're seeing on the right is the most shaded areas are in green and the most exposed full sun areas are in red. And the yellow is, is in between. And what it shows are the north facing slopes, the steeper uh, east facing slopes, the deep canyons, those are where it's more shaded. And because it's more shaded, it's more moist or mesic and you get different, different natural communities. Mesic forest versus dry woodland, totally different. And this explains all kinds of vegetation distribution. All sorts of plant species can be predicted based on, in animal species even, predicted on this map right here. And when you take it in combination with some other data sets, it's really, really powerful. Uh, this is another area. This is uh, 
a major conservation site already. This is the White River Hills ecoregion at Devil's Eyebrow Natural Area. And the Nature Conservancy has a preserve here, the Walton Preserve. Game and Fish has uh, WMA here, borders Beaver Lake. Uh, the Land Trust has been interested in some things up here. Uh, massive uh, opportunity for conservation and a huge hotspot for biodiversity. And I've personally done a lot of field work here, so I use this as a good example. Um, you can see there those mesic slopes, north and east facing um, in green and the more exposed areas. But look in particular at this area here. This is the Indian Creek drainage, which is at both the, the Walton Preserve and the um, Devil's Eyebrow. And it's a it's an absolute hotspot for rare species. I mean, there's so many rare plants in here. Uh, it's just truly, truly remarkable. And this is that same area on this color infrared winter image. And the shaded, and this is true sun shading here. So the sun is in the southern half of the sky. Uh, it's showing that north facing slope shaded there. Um, I don't know if y'all can see my cursor, uh, this slope here. And then across the, there's a, a creek running down here towards the lake. And on that side, it's dry, totally different. I mean, diametrically opposed site conditions, natural communities, vegetation, dry glades, woodlands, uh, you know, grassland pockets, totally different than this closed canopy mesic forest. And if you look at the rare species found on these two slopes, on that, on that shaded slope, you get really rare mesic forest species from the north and from the Appalachians, like the taper tip ginger, hairy sedge, hairy sweet sicily, black maple, one of just a couple sites in, the, in Arkansas for this, all on that north slope. You walk a few hundred feet across the drain and you get totally different things over here. Great Plains ladies tress is a grassland species in dolomite glades. Tall pink glade onion, silky aster, Gattinger's goldenrod. These are all dry grassland uh, species. So anytime you get that much landscape diversity, you're getting incredible biodiversity as well. This is another product from that mapping effort that we worked with them on. This is the topographic wetness index. So this doesn't look at the sun shading, but it looks at just the influence of the topography on water availability. Uh, or where moisture is sort of stored in the landscape. And this is incredibly informative as well. You start looking at this, this is Lake Sequoia right here on the right. And then these are forks of the White River in these flat valleys. And you can see the blue is the moisture or sites that have a high topographic wetness index, which just means because it's a flat area, it's along a river, it's got depressions within it, it's gonna hold a lot of, of moisture. And then the, the redder areas are steeper slopes that drain off quickly and so on. So um, you combine this with that solar radiation model and you can really start to, to understand vegetation. Uh, this is an area in Northwest Benton County uh, that was historically seasonally wet prairie and it maps very much as that today. It's the, the flat plains area I'm talking about with, the, with all the blue and kind of beige and then the more rugged terrain uh, shown red, which is drier. Uh, lower index. And then together they, they can map all that. And this is this modern day land cover map. Um, you know, this, this will be refined uh, throughout the next year as they're finishing the state map, but it's a good uh, working map for Northwest Arkansas. None of these models are perfect, um, but they're still useful, very useful in uh, giving us a perspective. And then this is a different uh, modeling uh, vegetation map. This is uh, basically, you could say historical vegetation or really it's, it's potent ecological potential vegetation. So, you know, obviously all this tan here, beige is not prairie today. It was prairie 200 years ago uh, or Savannah or whatever it is. And this was done by the Central Hardwoods Joint Venture a few years ago uh, for most of the Ozarks and some areas over in Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, but it's also useful. Uh, again, none of these models are perfect. You wouldn't go out to one of these spots and necessarily expect to definitely see what they predicted, but it's still a useful uh, conceptual model. Um, another map that we, mapping exercise that we did, we did tons of different mapping efforts on this, but this is an attempt to map these monadnocks, these, these remnants of the old, or the 
it's it's funny they're they're remnants of something old but the geology is younger than than the surrounding land if that makes sense so the boston mountains are younger than the springfield plateau but they were mostly eroded away after they were laid down uh that plateau was laid down but there's still remnants of it and we were able to, to map those with lidar and soils and geology uh very precisely and again if you were if you had money to buy a thousand acres or five thousand acres and you wanted to do the most good grabbing something that had a lot of diversity in it and natural quality still is another factor would be a good a good move and um these monadnocks around the valley around the base of them typically have typical springfield plateau vegetation and things and then the boston mountain stuff on top and in a small area you're getting a lot of biodiversity same thing on the ecoregion boundaries where you can get that transition zones typically much more biodiverse than the same size area deep within any given ecoregion um, and then there's some really cool historical mapping that we did. This is a map of the historical prairies in the original land survey plat map. So these are about 200 years old. This is the one on, me, on, the, on the left. And uh, those green areas were mapped in the original land survey as, as prairie. The map on the right is really even more interesting in my mind. This is a digitized version that we made of some hand illustrated maps in a senior thesis done by a guy named Henry Miller in 1972. He was a student at the U of A in archeology span and he was wanting to know what the vegetation was like in prehistoric times um, when Native American cultures were occupying this area or using it. And um, he did an incredible job at this where he took the actual survey notes of the surveyors walking a mile by mile grid over this whole area and describing the vegetation. And he mapped this out in these series of, I don't know, 60 hand-drawn maps or something, uh, six miles by six miles cells. And we digitized that and he, he classified five major vegetation types. And this is a 200 year old snapshot. So before massive changes following settlement here. And what, what you see there correlates pretty incredibly with um, all these models and things. So it's, it's kind of neat. But he had two different kinds of prairies, lowland and upland. And really those, those don't hold up so much because there's variation within each of the types. Um, but you could say definitely, you know, prairie-like or open savanna, uh, but really prairie, probably pretty close to where he said. Two types of forest, lowland and upland. We would probably say today a lot of that upland forest was woodland or more open even you know but but upland and dry seasonally and then the neatest thing about this is the oak barrens which is the beige color and huge areas about half of benton county was described by those surveyors as oak barrens which is their way of saying savannah and I mean, in huge parts of Washington County too, pretty much everything on the plateau that wasn't prairie or a creek bottom. And um, that's just an astounding thing because that is so long gone. It has either been cleared for agriculture and pastures long, long ago, or it's grown up into dense woods. And we have lost that from our collective memory, but we've uncovered uh, descriptions of it in historical accounts as part of this project as well. Uh, we're asking these four major questions. What is the biodiversity of these counties? What are the most ecologically sensitive areas? Where's the best remaining? Um, the, what is the best remaining opportunities for conservation? And how does this biodiversity overlay with all the other open space planning objectives that are going on in the region? There's so much interest in um, you know, green space and outdoor recreation. There's tons of kind of win-win opportunities between traditional biodiversity conservation and those other efforts. But it's we've got to know where the, I guess the first rule of biodiversity conservation is it has to be done where there's actually biodiversity. And that's sometimes that that fundamental principle is sometimes lost. And so we're trying to provide that information 
uh, to people interested in that. And then this is what these dots are, are the, the heritage, the heritage records. So, you know, we find all these occurrences of rare species, uh, whether they're old specimens or modern day field observations, and we're putting those in, in a data set and that can be used for conservation planning. Each of those dots is an occurrence of a species of animal, plant, or natural community. And in our agency and all our conservation partners use that data to do conservation planning. We have this focal areas map that drives sort of where we put our money in building your public nature preserve system. It's done based on the best available information. And you know you can zoom in and, and see on the ground, it, it really can, can show you hot spots or clusters of areas where a lot of interesting things have been found. And they usually correlate with an unusual habitat. Uh, almost always. So that's uh, something to know as well. And then we can identify important sort of macro sites or uh, aggregate sites based on uh, the occurrences that, of all these species and natural communities. Um, back to the report. Uh, another thing we did was a lot of historical research. So we read all kinds of old historical accounts. Uh, we actually hired, and I, I regret that I didn't list her, uh, I just listed the, um, the uh, species group authors in that first slide, and I'll have to adjust that, but uh, we hired a historian uh, who's been a, actually a long-term collaborator of mine, Story Matt Kenron. she's a professor at UCA, um, and uh, she prepared with me just sort of as a co-author, a lengthy chapter on what we call the natural and cultural history of the county. And this is a pretty interesting chapter that goes back in time. It's, it's got all kinds of great, and it's done like a history uh, paper. So it has footnotes, which is different than the way the scientists uh, cite their stuff, but it has the full sort of historical um, footnotes uh, throughout that chapter. And it traces from, you know, the last ice age through um, settlement times or up to the present, really. Uh, and, and not only how humans affect the landscape, but how humans use the landscape and the flora and fauna. So it goes back to bluff shelter uh, artifacts of, of plants and animals uh, that were found in Benton, Washington counties. Uh, there's a moccasin here on the upper right that was uh, made out of rattlesnake master, which is a prairie and savanna plant. Um, lots of interesting interpretation of these artifacts. Um, looking at early plants that were domesticated in this area, like our incredible diversity of, of the native Ozark gourd, which has become an interest of mine. Um, grasses, or they found seeds that Native Americans actually cultivated these uh, as uh, grain crops. Uh, these are native prairie plants, uh, many of them associated with bison wallows, which is interesting, and other uh, grain plants and seed plants that, that were used. All this is interpreted. These are figures from the report. Um, we had a section on extinct and extirpated uh, species. There's uh, four birds that were found in Benton and Washington County historically. We have good records of these uh, that are extinct today. Um, these are the Carolina parakeet, the passenger pigeon, the uh, Bachman's warbler, and Eskimo curlew. And then of course red wolves were, were common uh, in Benton and Washington County at one time. They've been extirpated. They're uh, actually only a few left in, in the wild anywhere and they're in coastal North Carolina now. They've all been relocated there um, on the verge of extinction. The elk that we had historically in Benton Washington counties is now extinct. That was the Eastern elk. Uh, and then of course we had lots of bison uh, in those grasslands in Benton Washington County historically. And they are not extinct, but extirpated from our region for sure. Um, we have great quotes, and I don't have time to, to read a lot of these. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna save the uh, the presentation, I guess, and you can you can pause it and read these great quotes. Here's one on the the animals that that the early settlers were describing uh, around Prairie Grove and Fayetteville area, mountain lions, bears, wolves, etc bison uh, and there's some great bison quotes from northwest arkansas where they talk about um the bison licks these salt salt areas where the bison would would lick and make depressions uh when it was wet and uh, and all this and and they talk about 
bison skulls being still found even after the bison were gone the, the bison skulls littered the prairies uh one per every three acres or so uh, according to this account and then people in the early 1800s coming up on herds of bison in Fayetteville pretty This is a, uh, we did an, an interpretation. Molly read something like a thousand pages of the original land survey notes. And we looked at all the old plat maps. So these are again, about almost 200 years old now, 1830s. And uh, they actually mapped some of the, the Buffalo licks. Like here's one right here. Uh, this is just up upstream from Lake Sequoia. Uh, and I've actually looked at this spot um, thinking maybe there'd be some remnant of it, but it's in somebody's front yard. So uh, I think we were too late to see any remnants of this bison lick uh, southeast of Fayetteville. Um, they also mapped original uh, prairie openings um, and we digitized those as part of this work. Uh, so that's available. Uh, anybody can get that layer when this project's finished. And um, yeah, this is really useful. So now something to know about these the surveyors went on the section lines. So it's this grid, these boulder lines, it's a mile by a mile grid. And as they traveled along the line and they entered or left the prairie, they would record the exact distance from the start of the line. We still use this grid so we know exactly where they were and we can map that. So that's kind of neat. So they could say, um, you know, we left the prairie here. Now the drawing on the plat map that they made at the end of the survey where this line really was on the ground is anybody's guess, right? It's between the two lines. The border of the prairie is probably very approximate. And we know that the map at the end of the digitization of these, these plat map prairies is very much a low ball estimate. I mean, it might even be like half the prairies that were up there because some of the surveyors didn't bother. Like here's a good example. This prairie is mapped down to the township boundary, this bold line. And the surveyor that did the, the southwestern, uh, the, the township southwest of here didn't bother. So obviously the prairie went into that. Did it close right there where it went in or did it open up again and have another 3000 acres on it? Um, if they didn't map it, we don't know. So it's not a perfect map. So know that as you, as you look at this, but it's still really awesome. And uh, there's some great uh, historical accounts from the late 1800s from old people describing how much grassland and open savanna had been lost from 1820 to 1890, uh, 1880. Really impressive to read these, some of these accounts, uh, how much stuff had grown up in, in trees after landscape scale fires were no longer being set by Native Americans who'd been displaced. Uh, all kinds of interesting, um, interesting uh, ramifications of historical events. Uh, we also we also found some interesting things in the GLO, but also in the historical museum record, uh, talking about historical occurrence of species, of biodiversity. And one of the neatest of these was uh, we found some online digitized specimens of Phragmites, Americanus, which is, if you're familiar with Phragmites, there's a terrible invasive uh, from your, Europe that is uh, taking over wetlands across the United States, especially in coastal areas, but, but even now in Arkansas. And it's one of the worst invasives as grass gets 15, 16 feet tall. There can be a hundred stems per square foot, super dense stands of this. But there is a native one as well that is on the decline big time and is mostly found far to our north. But there were specimens of one of these reeds from Fayetteville area from the 1800s, 1880s. And because of the date, I immediately thought, wow, that could be the native one, but it's not known from Arkansas. In fact, the nearest it gets here is like Illinois and central Missouri, northern Missouri. And um, I sent an email to the curator at the University of Michigan herbarium where the specimen was located. And he knows a lot about this species because he's got the native one up where he is. And he said, yeah, I'll check it out. And he emailed me back the next day and said, you're absolutely right. That's the native one for sure. 
and he made a note on the specimen. And um, then years, this was several years ago, and then years later, as we were going through the, the plat map and the GLO uh, records, we uncovered a record of a, what they called a swamp. It was actually a type of wetland we'd call a thin, which is a spring-fed uh, open meadow up in, in Benton County near Maysville. And they described a, a swamp up there. It said the swamp is very boggy, reed grass very thick and about 10 feet high. Well, there's nothing else. I sat and thought about every plant species in the region. There's nothing else that would be in that habitat and fit that description. And so there's no question in my mind that that surveyor was in a big patch of the native reed grass, which is super rare and not been seen in Arkansas, uh, at least not documented since 1880. And so that was pretty neat to me. And of course, we know exactly where he was because the surveyor made a drawing of the wetland. I put it on a modern day aerial photograph and you know the wetland's gone. There's now a a pond built, artificial pond built on the spring that flooded the, the wet thin meadow. And then there's a drainage ditch uh, dug through that, that of course drained the rest of the area so it could be a cattle pasture, which it is today. Um, and I, I actually never got back up to, to walk around the roadside and see if there wasn't any Phragmites left, but I did look on Google Earth Street View and that place is so altered, I didn't see any. You wouldn't miss this grass. It's quite impressive. Um, anyway, this is a neat story, one of hundreds. These are some plates of species of plants that were known only from the historical record. And these are actual specimens. Uh, the specimen on the upper left is the oldest. Well, there's about 10 specimens, I guess, eight specimens from this trip. They're the oldest surviving herbarium specimens from Benton, Washington County. And this was made in 1835 by George Engelman, who was a doctor in St. Louis and a botanist. And he traveled through Northwest Arkansas in 1835. And there's a few specimens that he collected that still survive. And that species has never been found again in Arkansas or in Northwest Arkansas. We have two sites for it down near Texas border in Southwest Arkansas in Chalky Prairies. And that was the, probably the habitat it was in uh, near Cane Hill and um, never seen again. And then this is a liatris, uh, punctata, the dotted gay feather. This one, this particular species has not been ever collected in Arkansas again. That's the only record. And that was up near Gateway or Garfield in Benton County um, on the Springfield Plateau. And then one of the neatest things was a total surprise. It was a new state record. Um, from this old specimen on the right. This is a plant called uh, trailing ratany or ratani, which is a uh, Western species. I've seen it in grasslands in Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, there are disjunct set of populations in dry grasslands in Florida. And this specimen was made in the west side of Fayetteville somewhere back in uh, the 20s. And it must have been in some kind of glady shale grassland or something like that. Um, it, it, it says woods, which would be, it, it would have been in an opening in the woods. And this has never been, we didn't even know this was ever in Arkansas. And it's never been found in modern times. So this is one you could find in Northwest Arkansas, uh, looking around Fanville. So keep your eye out in little rocky grasslandy places. And then these are a set of photo plates of rare species of plants that are known only from historical specimens. Um, 30 years old or older, in some cases not seen since the 1800s in Benton and Washington counties. All of them are rare. We'd love to find these. Um, you can see on the lower left of the right photo plate is uh, the showy lady slipper orchid. There's a specimen from Fayetteville area from a wet fen meadow uh, in the 1800s, um, never been found again. There were reports of it in Benton County um, some of the sites believed to have been flooded by Beaver Lake, others dug out by collectors, uh, but no records today of that species or, or any of these others in these plates, but all historical and all of conservation concern, they can be relocated. And details in the captions and all this stuff, and in the plant list as well. More, unfortunately, there's lots of pictures of these historical only gone from the region today specimens, species. But 
any of these could turn up as well. That's the, I guess the, the positive thing is with more inventory, any of these could turn up. Um, I want to talk, I mean, just, I don't have time to go through all the habitats, obviously, but you know, all the, the natural communities or habitats get, get treated in the report. They'll get a description. We'll talk about where they occur, what the, the non-biological uh, characteristics are, you know, the certain types of things are on south slopes where it's sunny or on this geology or whatever. It'll have a list of, you know, rare species that are known from them or, or whatever else uh, you might need to know about them. But I'm just going to show you a few examples. And one of those is the cliff and talus community. So talus, everyone knows what a cliff is, but talus, if you don't know, is the accumulation of loose rock fragments at the base of cliffs. And that's an actual different type of habitat. It's real important for some plant and animal species. Uh, so that's one to know about and look for. Um, there are many subtypes of cliffs. They're divided based on the geology type, uh, what the pH might be. They're divided on, in some cases, their size of a huge cliff, maybe have totally different flora than a small one. Um, they're divided based on their aspect, the direction they face. They're divided by how moist they are. Here's a dripping one, a wet wall cliff in the upper left. Um, there's a real dry cliff across on the other plate. Um, all of these are sort of interpreted. And, and the geology, different rock formations have different vegetation on them and so on. So there's lots of different types of cliffs and they're all sort of laid out. Not everyone is described in full detail, uh, just time and space constraints and so on, but, but they're all sort of acknowledged. There are different microhabitats within these cliffs. There's things like, um, well, there's a talus slope and you can see I'm standing in the photo in the upper left and I'm at the junction between the cliff face and the talus slope below. And um, I'm do, looking at a rare plant, as I recall, uh, right at that spot. You also get uh, rock houses, which is sort of a cliff shelter, bluff shelter overhang. There's some species that very much depend on those. There's some rare invertebrates that like the deep leaf deposits that accumulate in those. There's some rare plants that occur along the drip line of the cliff. Uh, the biggest cliffs were along the White River. Uh, there were some huge cliffs. Um, most of those are at least mostly or at least halfway inundated by Beaver Lake and the, the vegetation and, and fauna at the base of these are, are long gone, but uh, they're still important uh, habitats. And there's still some really rare things on these cliffs above the waterline. Uh, so that's good to know. And there's some interesting cave features in some of these springs and seeps. Uh, the, the cedar tree there in the upper uh, left of the right plate is ashes juniper, which is a, a species typically found in the Edwards Plateau of Texas. We have populations that are disjunct or removed from the main range on these kind of high cliff lines in the White River Hills and also in some glades as well. It's a neat area. Um, here's some cliffs on limestone and shale, uh, different areas, some rock houses along the Illinois River. There are rare features in the Boston Mountains associated with some cliffs, these slot canyons or, or crevice caves, which is kind of a different sort of a cave than the ones that form in limestone. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but there's some endangered Ozark big-eared bats in one of these, these crevices um, in southern Washington County. And then there's some rare plants of cliffs. So sometimes we'll have a few plates of some of the rarest species that are associated with that habitat. Here's some more rare species of cliffs. That, um, that one in the upper two photos of the right plate is the Arkansas alum root, and that is known only from Arkansas and nowhere else in the world, and primarily in the Boston Mountains, um, and those outliers of the Bostons across the Benton County as well. In fact, that species was described from the little remnants of the Boston Mountains at Springdale. So in 1895, it was described as a new species from Bentonville, or from uh, Springdale, Arkansas. That's kind of a neat, neat story behind that one specific to Northwest Arkansas. Um, we used to be able to map cliffs only from like topographic maps. Um, and as a result, we had, turns out kind of a poor 
I mean, better than nothing, but kind of a poor understanding of how many cliffs were out there, where they were, and uh, what they were like. And the LIDAR has completely revolutionized uh, our ability to detect these habitats. Again, seeing through the trees, seeing topography in great detail. And uh, this is a little remnant of the Boston Mountains, south side of Fayetteville called Puddin Hill. And you can see here um, the level of detail that the LIDAR shows. You can see individual blocks of rock that have broken off the cliff face. You can see it strewn down the mountainside. And then off to the right there, you can see an area that looks like it's made of melted wax on the hillside. That's a landslide. And that landslide might be thousands of years old or hundreds of years old, covered over today by forest. No one would ever knew it, it was there, but um, you know, you can see it on this, this image. So it's kind of neat. And it's amazing with the LIDAR, how many landslides, especially in the Boston mountains, there are, and it's neat. Um, this is uh, an area of the White River Hills, and you can see from the LIDAR, uh, a lot of cliffs up there that you might not, these don't even really show on the topographic map. Um, maybe one, the most major cliffs up there might show, but otherwise you can't detect them. And we can go in now, we did a lot of cliff mapping related to this project. Uh, we did not complete all of the counties. Um, we hope to do that, but there are so many cliffs and the LIDAR is so informative that is just months and months and months of work to digitize these, but we can do it super accurately. And it's really, really uh, been a game changer for finding rare species of plants that live on cliffs and other things. And, you know, I'm sure the rock climbers love this LIDAR too, because you can see all kinds of stuff they didn't know was there. Um, we mapped those historical prairies. We also have the glade map. So glades were mapped prior to the start of this project, but they were very useful uh, in the inventory and we're able to see where they are. Um, these were mapped from 12 sets of aerial photographs over multiple, a long time period. And the, the, the red is the, the historical prairies, the yellow are the, the glades. And there's multiple different types and they vary on where they occur um, in the counties. Uh, they're not, we don't know for sure all the geology of these because the geology has not been precisely mapped. So some of these, might say sandstone in the data set, but they're really maybe shale. There's a lot of mix, you know, one slope might have two or three types. So take that with a grain of salt a little bit, but you know, it's a glade, but it's a very accurate map, no question. And one of the things that turned up in that glade map that prior to the glade map in 2016, we didn't even really know existed or we had a knowledge of a few examples, but we had no idea how many there were and where they were. And these are Ozark Shale Barrens. And so think of this as an undiscovered habitat, but you know, nobody really understood or knew about. It. And most of them are in Southern Washington County and maybe adjacent Crawford County. That's probably the hot spot for these. I think there's a couple hundred that have been mapped. Uh, very few have actually been inventoried, but um, it's a great conservation target for sure. Um, we have plates of the major glade types with some great images, all from Northwest Arkansas. Uh, these are some limestone and dol or dolomite glades, limestone glades, more limestone glades on the left, sandstone glades on the right, which have a different pH, different geology. They're flatter typically. They have a wetland component. Uh, all these glade types are different. So if you want to protect the biodiversity, you have to get multiple examples of each type sort of an area, every major region they occur. So that's the redundancy of conservation planning. You wanna to make sure that you're uh, targeting multiple examples of these. And now we know where they are. So this will be, this will be helpful. Um, sandstone glades are another type that we didn't really understand or know much about are sandstone scour glades. So these occur along high gradient streams and rivers in the Boston mountains. And these are on Lee Creek down in Southern Washington County near Devil's Den State Park. And um, they are glady bedrock. Uh, glades, I should have said, are naturally treeless openings in an otherwise forested landscape 
and they're naturally treeless because bedrock outcrops or comes real close to the surface of the ground. And so they fit that bill, but they also receive periodic violent scour from floods of these high gradient rivers. It's a natural process that sort of maintains, helps maintain their openness and keep cedar trees and other things from taking them over. And uh, there's some interesting things. We don't know a lot about them, uh, but we did get into a few examples uh, as part of this inventory and uh, found some interesting things. And then there's these shale barrens, that's on the right. Uh, these are old growth post oak trees and blackjack oak trees on Kessler Mountain. They cord some of the trees up there. They're over 250 years old. And these are some rare species of plants known from, in this case, limestone and dolomite glades. And there's much more detail on these in the, in the report, of course. I need to pick up the pace a little bit if I'm gonna get through this. Um, I will talk about a few species in detail. Um, you know, we prioritize species for conservation based on those conservation status ranks. So there's two kinds of rarity, I guess you could say. There's things that are rare in Arkansas, but maybe common somewhere else, we call them state rare. Um, and they might be on the edge of their range, say in Northern species like black maple is a good example. We only have two or three populations in Benton County, maybe one in Carroll County. And that's all for Arkansas. Other than that, they occur far to our North, Northern Missouri, North from there, over the Appalachians as well. But it's fairly common in the main part of its range, but it's very rare in Arkansas. That is important conservation target for us, mainly because, or partially because of its, it's in a rare habitat. It's an ancient remnant of the ice age, those north facing mesic forests and those canyons at Devil's Eyebrow. But there are other species that are globally rare. They're known only from a small region, only from one habitat type maybe. And these are some examples of those. So um, going sort of left to right, that goldenrod there is Gattinger's goldenrod. And that was not even known to occur in Arkansas until like 2003 or something, where it turned up in some dolomite glades over in Marion or Boone County. And turns out it's in multiple sites in dolomite glades, especially in, in the White River Hills. But the, it was originally described from central Tennessee glades around Nashville. And so there's like a cluster of populations over there. Then it was found in the Missouri Ozarks on Dolomite. And now we found it uh, in Arkansas on several sites. But it's over there in those White River Hills areas. Globally very rare. And folks are really interested in studying. When you, anytime you get something that has a bimodal distribution, they're far away from each other, two parts of its range. These to be studied because oftentimes they're very distinct uh, genetically. And when you really start to look, sometimes you'll find, wow, they really look different too. And they get split out as new species, each one rarer than previously thought. And that's probably going to be the case with Gatineers Goldenrod based on some folks I've talked to in Tennessee that are looking at it. So um, anyway, that's one that turned up in Benton County. Um, the bottle brush blazing star is an interesting one. We thought it was more pretty widespread um, in Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and then sort of a separate population over here in the Ozarks proper in Dolomite Glades. Well, it turns out, uh, just like the Gatineau's Goldenrod, people are starting to look at it and said, no, this is actually close, more closely related. It's different than the, the bottle brush blazing star in, in Texas over there. There's another rare species in Texas that is close, more closely related to this one, and it's probably new to science. So this may be split out for long as well and would only occur uh, in our dolomite glades in the narrow part of the Ozarks. And then Trelisa's larkspur, beautiful, brilliant blue um, delphinium found only in dolomite glades in just a few counties in the world over there in the White River Hills. Pretty neat. And then this is a neat one. This is a new cactus for Arkansas that I found when we were uh, doing surveys up near Devil's Eyebrow. And it was in these interesting glades, these really extreme uh, limestone glades. So this is above the dolomite glades, up higher on the ridge, at the heads of hollows. We call them hollow head glades because they're right at the head of the steep drop off down these hollows in the, in the 
junction between the dissected Springfield Plateau and the White River Hills. And um, I immediately, I walked in this glade and I saw about a dozen clumps of this cactus and they were huge. They were three feet tall. The pads were up to 10 inches across. And one of the, 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 the one in this photograph was eight feet across. So it was eight feet across, three feet tall, huge pads. It wasn't in flower yet, but the cool thing about these cacti is you can just break off a pad with a bud on it. And I took them home and laid them next to my driveway. And a month later they flowered and I was able to get a specimen with the flowers and everything. And we initially thought it was this thing called Lindheimer's prickly pear. And um, I put some photos on iNaturalist and we made the specimen and we called it Lindheimer's prickly pear, which, which would be a Texas thing that's jumped like many other things in the White River Hills makes a jump up to the, the glades up here, but it would have been an, a new one. It turned out um, an expert in, in these cacti got on iNaturalist and looked at them and said, oh my gosh, you got something else. This is a rarer thing called the, the round pad prickly pear. And it was definitely new to Arkansas. Uh, it's gotta be native in that site. Um, that was an interesting thing. It could be at other sites, but we've never found any more population so far. Um, prairies and grasslands, major, major conservation importance. Uh, this is probably as a group, the most important, most imperiled uh, habitat type in Northwest Arkansas. These areas, and it's by virtue of where they occurred, they occurred on the surface of the Springfield Plateau. Many of them were fertile enough to be used for agriculture. All of them were suitable for conversion to cattle pastures. Many of them were in the flat terrain where settlements began and cities now have developed. So we've really lost almost all of the high quality prairie lands. Um, there's a couple protected ones, which is great. There's some unprotected ones that are in great peril. And even though they're small, their importance just can't be overstated. Oh, and of course there's different types. So there's wet ones, there's dry ones, there's high pH, there's low pH, all these different types. Um, there's chert, there's limestone, there's different things. Uh, and they're all really critical and important. In some cases, the prairie flora is only remaining in the roadsides. And you know, the, one of the reasons they're so important, even though they're so small, most of the remnants are so small, is that these are literally the seed source for massive restoration. So we can go to these and gather the seeds off these plants. It's the only place these plants occur anymore. And we can produce them at a commercial scale if we want to and get them broadcast out, shared out, sold for restoration. And you're using the local genetics. That's super important. Um, a few more plates just interpreting these grasslands and the, the species of plants. and these different types. Um, in the prairies, there's another real important um, habitat or feature, I would say habitat. Um, there's these things called nebkas or pimple mounds. And if you live in Northwest Arkansas, you've probably seen these. If not, start looking for them and you will. And these are things that we knew were around, but when the LIDAR came out, we, had our minds blown by how many there were, uh, although they're disappearing very rapidly from Northwest Arkansas. I'll qualify with that statement. This is a remnant prairie. Uh, it's actually in the Arkansas River Valley. Um, so not in Benner, Washington County, but it shows looking out over this remnant prairie, you see these undulating sort of lens shaped mounds. And these are natural features. They are ancient windblown dunes. So there was a time when these grasslands were so arid and dry that there was a lot of bare soil. And around in between that in little pockets, there might've been clumps of grass or shrubs. And in really dry droughty times when high wind would come, it would deflate or remove the soil from the flats and accumulate it around or it would accumulate around these clumps of vegetation. Um, climate's been changing over time. At some point it became wetter and more, more cool or at least more moist and grasses stabilize these 
these dunes, and they're still present on the landscape today. They're strongly associated with grasslands. Now we do find them in the woods around areas that were grassland, um, but that just means that they were grasslands further back. Um, you know, the, nowadays in the climate and without fire and bison and other things that kept prairie prairie, um, maybe those, they were in savannas historically, but now they've grown up in trees. But finding the remnants of these is an excellent clue for where we might restore uh, prairie. When you see them, it's a sign, when you see them at their full height, um, it's a sign that the area was never plowed for agriculture. That's the death of the prairie. When something's been plowed for agriculture, it's game over for the prairie. You could plant prairie species back from seed maybe and have some facsimile, but you'll, it's, it's really gone. Um, if it's just been converted to pasture, sometimes there's still a few species hanging on of the original flora and it can be restored. And the height of the mounds or the intactness of the mounds is a good character. Now, not all grasslands had them, so I should qualify that, but many of them did, especially in the Springfield Plateau. Now, this is in Benton County. This is Chesney Prairie Natural Area. And uh, Joan Reynolds sent me this picture of the mounds there. And you can see that yellow flower, the mealy fumor, it's a real prairie thing. And it's found almost only on the mounds. It loves the mounds. So there's certain species that are only there. The soil is very different on the mounds than it is in the intervening flats. It's more well-drained. It's deeper, it's more fertile. Um, it's just a, a real different habitat. And, and of course, having the, the wet flats next to the dry mounds creates a lot of diversity of habitat. Um, we were able to map these remnant mounds with the LIDAR, and that's what these yellow polygons are. So for scale, or just for reference, this is Southern two thirds of Washington County or so. And um, the blue lines, the Boston Mountains, Springfield Plateau ecoregion boundary, and um, you know, mostly these are in the Springfield Plateau, but they are along the valley lands in the Boston's. And I'll show you a few pictures here. This is, the, uh, this is it on an aerial photo. And you can see they're concentrated in areas that are open today and they were open historically. These were the prairies and savannas where these uh, mounds were found. And this is that historical prairie map in black from that GLO plat map. Uh, data set. So I laid that over the Nebka mounds or the, the Nebka fields that we mapped. And you can see there's a pretty good correlation, at least everywhere there's or a lot of places where the, the prairie was uh, mapped, you can see the, uh, the yellow areas that still have the mounds. But it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's a lot outside the mounds. And this is the this is the explanation right here. This is that GLO uh, vegetation analysis that Henry Miller did in the 70s. Um, and you can see the areas that he called savanna pretty much capture a lot of the rest of these, um, rest of these Nebka fields or pimple mounds. And you can see these on a good winter shot uh, aerial photo. This is that infrared series and um, you can see the mounds very clearly, but on another aerial photo, they won't be visible at all. They're showing up here because the soil was moist and the dark areas in between them are moist soil. Um, you can also see that there's a lot in this aerial photo that don't have the yellow box on them. So you say, well, why didn't you map those? Well, this is an older aerial photo I mentioned. This is like a 2006 image or maybe even a 2002 image and this is on the south side of Fayetteville. So if you look at a modern day image, well, there's the LIDAR. So the LIDAR is just a few years old and you could still see the mounds all over the LIDAR, even in the area that wasn't mapped. But if you look at a modern day aerial photograph, that's why. We are at the end of the ability to protect these sites. This area right here is owned by the city of Fayetteville. That's the Woolsey, Woolsey Wet Prairie Sanctuary. This area here is the West Side Prairie Preserve, which is the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust. So they have protected some of those. And then down here, this is interesting. 
This area here, if you, I hope you all can see my cursor on this recording. This is the area by the um, West Side Water Treatment Plant that is today forested. But you can see in there all those pimple mounds. That was one time wet prairie. Then it is now wet flatwoods, but it's too dense. That needs to be opened up a little bit, thinned out. And incredible things are probably waiting in there for a little sunlight to be restored. Um, also, just because there's pimple mounds visible doesn't mean it's a restorable site. We are classifying these in three um, categories. There's high, medium, and low. And you could consider that the size or the height of the mound, but you could also consider, consider that the priority uh, level for a restorability. It's, it's highly restorable. <clears throat> Just a second. <clears throat> highly restorable, um, sort of restorable, and low is probably marginally worth the effort uh, at this point. But when you see the full high mounds, it's not uh, guaranteed, but more likely than not, it's in a little more restorable site. Uh, related to the prairie savanna, this is Chesney Prairie Natural Area. It's prairie in the foreground, but if you look over the landscape in the background, that's that savanna. The structure is still there a lot of places, although there are cattle pastures now, and the, uh, the vegetation's gone. It used to be 300 species of plants on the ground, and now there's 30, um, and they're mostly not native, but it shows you kind of what it would have looked like. Um, to really see savannas in Arkansas today, you got to go to Fort Chaffee. Fort Chaffee Military um, Base down in the River Valley has landscape scale areas of, of savanna intact, incredible sites, um, old growth post oaks, old pine trees, hundreds of species on the ground, tens of thousands of acres, just incredible. And the reason it's still there is in part because people hadn't messed it up, but also the fires ignited from military training uh, are allowed to burn over a big area. And, uh, and they do prescribe burning too, but it's kept that whole landscape intact as grassland savanna. It's an incredible site. Um, other areas are being restored in other places. And these are some Arkansas savannas uh, at other spots. Um, yeah, you can sort of see these are not in Benton, Washington County, but gives you the, the feel. Sometimes they're real shrubby, but it's native grassland with scattered trees. And there really can be more diverse than prairies because you have the prairie stuff that's um, typically found in the, um, the open grasslands. But you also get some things that need a little shade around the trees or in the pockets of trees, uh, more woodland things, and you, you get them all. Uh, where it would be too sunny in a strictly a prairie landscape. It'd be too shady uh, for other things in the, in the woods. So um, in the forest, but you get them here in the savannah. So this is a habitat that could be massively restored in Benton, Washington County. There's lots of areas that were savannah that have gone to dense woods, dense forest, uh, but the species that are native to those sites are gone on the ground, the plant species, because it's too shady for them, or they're hanging on barely. It's, you can see clues to their, you know, a few leaves hanging on, but they're never going to flower. They don't have enough light. Uh, in identifying those by looking at the remnant flora along the edge or in a power line cut that goes through them, will, and looking at that old Miller map and our other predictive model maps can tell you this site should be savanna. It was savanna. It was open woodland. This is a place to do 10,000 acres of restoration. This is about what the savannas that are left look like in Benton, Washington County. Uh, these are old growth post oak trees, ancient. Uh, these are at the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust uh, Lake Francis Preserve. This is a new preserve that is um, in the hills above the Illinois River, right on the border with Oklahoma, south of Siloam Springs. Most of it's rugged, deep hollows with chert, pine oak woodland, and forest, uh, but there's a bit of the Springfield Plateau left at the very top of the area where you drive in. And that area is a 
bona fide remnant savanna. It has the ancient trees, open grown. You can tell these aren't forest trees, right? They grew up in an open, without competition, and they have native savanna prairie flora still hanging on in the understory, but most of it is dense with little trees, really needs to be restored and, and they plan to do that. Um, awesome opportunity. And you, but mostly you're gonna see clues left uh, to where these savannas were. Uh, the upper left there is an old growth chinka pin oak at Healing Springs Natural Area. Clearly it's wooded around it today, but it's clearly open historically. Um, that's an old rare hawthorn species called Palmer's hawthorn on the upper right uh, at Woolsey Prairie. Who knows how old that tree is? Way older than it looks. And then there's an old growth bur oak there in the southern end or the, the lower right. Um, this is a Northwest Arkansas uh, Community College nature area, which is a post oak savanna woodland restoration. Uh, it is a remnant uh, and they've been working hard to restore it and it's looking awesome. But there's lots more of these up there that could be restored. Uh, there's different types of woodlands, which are a little more closed, but not really forest. There's a little space between the trees. These are mostly in our drier uplands. They occur in different types. These are acidic, calcareous. There's some acidic pine uh, woodlands. Shortleaf pine is pretty rare in Benton County. There's like three or four pockets of it. Cobb State Park, the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust, Lake Francis area, up around Bella Vista, down around Dutch Mills, just a few pockets of pine. And those are important conservation targets in the Springfield Plateau. Um, I'm gonna have to pick it up here. I'm gonna kind of end out with a lot of cool photos. Then we do have natural forests, the mesic forests. These are in the more moist, protected, shaded areas along rivers, along deep hollows, north facing slopes, below cliff lines. And there's a bunch of rare species, of, a bunch of rare biodiversity that needs forests, but they're not everywhere. They're in special places. There's a whole system of riverine forests on different terraces of the larger Ozark rivers. We have great illustrations and explanations of these in the report that are going to show uh, the different terrace levels and the different types of, of forest and in some cases shrubland that occur on these. These are the high gradient types on the, on the high mountain streams, high gradient mountain streams. There's mid gradient types along mid gradient larger streams and small rivers. And then there's the big ones on like the white in Illinois uh, that have uh, you know almost a large river low gradient uh, system. And they have their own different types, including cane breaks. This is another really important habitat type that's declined. There were historically large stands of the native bamboo or river cane, very important for some rare species of birds and insects. And this is a rare habitat type in general. We have a great method that we refined on this project to map these using winter shot aerial infrared images. The cane is semi evergreen. And if you get the right photograph, you can see the cane in pink and red and map it very precisely. And we did a series of ground truthing experiments where we went up to the Illinois River and the White River and were able to absolutely conclusively say we know how to map uh, cane breaks. And that'll be a product from this as well. Um, other mesic forest types, dry mesic forest types. Uh, there's all sorts of wetlands. We have some great diagrams in the report that show where different wetland types occur in the Northwest Arkansas landscape, specifically with where the geology and landforms are, um, you know, where the, where the wetlands fit in the geology and landforms. Uh, we have a couple different types of, uh, of wetlands. We couldn't show them all on one map, so, or one cutaway, so we've got two different things. Uh, some of these types are very rare. The Boston Mountain, Monadnock, Depression Ponds, the rare sinkhole wetlands on the mountaintops. They're ancient. Who knows how old they are? They can have very rare species of plants and also amphibians and insects. Uh, high, high priority for conservation. Very few of these in Northwest Arkansas, but we've been able to see where they are. Um, marshes type of wetland. There were types associated with the prairies. There were types associated with the larger rivers and streams with beaver marshes and so on. There were channel scar marshes and old abandoned river terrace channels. Uh, there's some other types of channel scar swamps, um, spring fed wetlands, flatwoods depressions and natural ponds, often associated with river terraces. Uh, the LIDAR has broken the 
the lid off the finding caves and karst features. This is a known site. This is Logan Cave um, National Wildlife Refuge, but it allows you to see things that you can't see otherwise through the trees. You can see sinkholes. You can see, of course, cliffs and cave mouth. That's the spring emerges there, but then there's other sinkholes that our staff didn't know existed, but they were under the trees there. Um, you can see them with the LIDAR, but there's literally hundreds and hundreds of these that no one knew about. Here's a cool place on Spavanaw Creek in Benton County that we found through the LIDAR. Um, interpretation is this, there's a stream, we call a losing stream that disappears underground and in these karst areas, uh, flowing along its channel, happy as can be, and then just goes down a hole. And even cooler, there's the ancient, uh, it didn't always go down the hole because there's the ancient, um, see, I've lost my cursor. The ancient uh, channel comes out over here. It used to flow uh, right there, but now it goes down the hole. It comes out down here uh, through a cave system. And there's all these sinkholes there all around. You can see the cliff lines and the limestone. Whole area is underlain by a limestone bed. Really cool. There's all sorts of springs. These are really important for a lot of rare aquatic uh, animal species and plants. Um, different sizes, different flow amounts, different chemistry. All these are important. This is a spring fed pond with all the, the mineral uh, precipitate coming out inside the different types of algae and rare aquatic plants in those, just amazing. There's a rare type of wetland called a fin, as I mentioned before, which is a calcareous high pH seepage meadow, mucky soil, tons of rare species. Uh, this is at Healing Springs Natural Area, which we recently um, took ownership of with the highway department. Um, massively degraded, but can be restored. And we're gonna be working on that. The floor is already coming back after the cows were taken off. And we look forward to seeing what all comes up there. This is another type of fin, a bunch of uh, native Virginia iris at the Northwest Arkansas Land Trust, Wilson Springs Preserve, which has some of the best fins in Northwest Arkansas. This is a characteristic fin species of uh, black-eyed Susan, uh, the shining cone flower, Rebecca palustris, uh, sedge, sedge dominated uh, woodlands and, and meadows there at Wilson Springs. Important groundwater fed spring runs, rare fish. This is two of the rarest fish uh, in the state uh, in these spring runs at, Wilson, at um, well, one is at Wilson Springs, but this is at Healing Springs Natural Area. Uh, there's all sorts of smaller springs with rare invertebrates uh, in them. Some of them are associated with caves, some are associated with geologic contacts, like this um, shale, there's some shale with some limestone on top. There on the on the left, that's at Kessler Mountain, and you can see the waters found its way at that along that geologic contact. And there's a spring there. Uh, there's all sorts of indicative flora. Some of it's rare, some of it's not. These aren't particularly rare species, but they're good indicators of groundwater presence. They're only found where you have groundwater. Here's some really rare species of plants known only from these groundwater wetlands. This one was new to Arkansas. This is the American um, speedwell. Uh, it's a groundwater fed thing here. We found about five sites in Benton, Washington counties. Wasn't known from Arkansas before this. This is at Healing Springs um, and Logan Springs, both um, coming out of these spring fed runs. Uh, it's common in the West, it's common in the Northeast. It's really rare in the central Southern mid continent. And it's been here all along, but we never knew about it. It's a glacial relic probably. There's again, the sort of result tab uh, page. You can see the beautiful pie chart that Molly made uh, by broader group. It breaks out like this. I'm just going to get you to these pictures. Based on conservation concern, that's all in there. There's five federally listed threatened, eight federally listed endangered, 29 on the ANHC watch list, and nearly 300 on the state list of species of concern uh, between plants and animals uh, there. And then nearly 200 that the authors feel are of concern that are not on the official list. Lots of important conservation targets in the counties. This is another breakdown of, the, of that by group. Uh, I'm just gonna run out my time showing you pictures. So here's some of the bird plates in their group. The plates are grouped by um, 
themes when possible. So these are all species of conservation concern, birds of conservation concern on these two plates. Still on birds of conservation concern on these two plates. And here's just some maybe more common birds, but of interest, showy, beautiful. These are herps or reptiles and amphibians of concern. Um, there's a crawfish frog and a hellbender sort of getting the top billing on these two. Ozark hellbender known historically uh, from Northwest Arkansas, gone today, unfortunately. Giant salamander. Um, other species of concern, some snakes and then some amphibians. Uh, some other um, turtles, lizards, and snakes not necessarily of concern. Uh, a couple of the crayfish plates. There's the monster there on the right, left of the right plate. That is the long pinchered crayfish, which is the largest species in the state. Very impressive. You can get about eight inches long. Uh, these are all uh, species of concern. Uh, no, maybe not, but sorry, I can't read the captions. They're too small. Um, other crayfish plates. There are some very rare species in the caves or in the groundwater. Uh, we did fungi. This is, to our knowledge, the first uh, inventory like this to ever treat the macro fungi, which are the large fungi. Um, so exclusive of the microscopic things, but the, the things you would maybe see and know. Uh, Jay Justice did an excellent account for those. Uh, there's some beautiful plates showing those. We've got just some interesting ones. We have some edible ones. We have some other interesting ones. None of these are official concern uh, because they've never been treated. No one's ever done an assessment to even, we don't even know enough about them really to know for sure which ones are the rare ones. Uh, we know some are common, but we know some are rare, but we don't have a whole lot of data. Some of them can't be, even be identified to species. Uh, we also, this is the first account like this we know of to do lichens. And Doug Ladd from the Missouri Botanical Garden did the lichens. He's one of the top lichenologists in the country. And uh, he did a bunch of field work for this project, weeks uh, on the ground in Benton, Washington County, and has a very good list of those. Uh, we did a spider account that uh, Ray Fisher prepared, really cool. Some excellent photography uh, that we found for the plates in that one. We got grasshoppers, we got bees, More bees. We got Mike Slated an excellent account of cave obligate species. So some of these are in, like bats are also in the mammal account, uh, but a lot of these are found in crayfish are in the crayfish account. But a lot of these are only in this special section on karst obligate species. And uh, and we do we reproduce the content uh, or or at least refer to the content for the bats and the crayfish that are in the caves in this chapter. But um, you can see some of the, uh, the really rare cave invertebrates. Uh, and there's some really rare ones. For example, this uh, beetle, the two beetles there in the, in the right plate in the lower right are um, ground beetles, only known from one place ever in Southern Washington County from 1938 and never found again. So the only photos we could get are of the specimen. Surely they're out there somewhere. Uh, just need someone to go find these, do, do a survey, do another survey, go look for these things. We got the Lepidoptera. Uh, here's some rare ones of conservation concern. Lepidoptera are the butterflies, skippers, and moths. These are skippers and mostly skippers on the right plate that feed only on canes. These are cane break species. So mapping those cane breaks is real important for understanding where the habitat is for these rare species of animal. Um, a lot of beautiful species in this group, and we we wanted to feature um, wanted to feature some of the interesting caterpillars and the showy moths, even the common you know sort of charismatic megafauna of the moths here. Um, and so we have some really great photo plates of these, um, and showing even some of the chrysalis for some of the more interesting species. We have a plate on camouflage and mimicry in in the moths that's really neat. It shows both the, um, 
and in detail in the captions and in the, you know, it's really a, really a rich, uh, going to be a rich report with a lot of good, interesting content, I think. Um, and then I was going to run out time on plants if I had it. I got about five minutes. Um, many of you may have been participants in some of the digitization efforts that were part of this. There was a whole, during the pandemic, we wanted to keep the project going, but we couldn't do field work. So we digitized thousands of specimens of um, and processed thousands of unprocessed specimens from Benton and Washington counties of plants and mainly plants, at least what we did. But, um, you know, some things were already digitized, but they weren't transcribed. Our botanist, former botanist, Diana Sotteropoulos, did an excellent uh, program of getting volunteers engaged to do digitization through the, we had some iNaturalist projects that I set up. So thousands of people participated, some knowing, some not. Uh, in gathering data for this assessment. And we got tens of thousands of observations on iNaturalists from each county. Uh, we got volunteers processing a backlog of specimens from the counties. Those are now digitized or being digitized. They were used as part of the data set for the plant lists. Um, we got the transcription stuff on notes from nature. Diana just took this and ran with it. She trained 157 volunteers that participated in the project. Um, she had a couple of workshops in Northwest Arkansas right before the pandemic hit. And I know some of you have been uh, really valuable partners and we thank you for your help. Uh, Diana led an effort that I just sort of helped on uh, publishing a paper on the methodology we use for this, specifically for this project. That's neat and will be available. And then I was gonna run through some of the interesting discoveries of plants that we found. Um, new species for the state, new species for the region. There were several. Karen Willard is a botanist in Northwest Arkansas that we contracted with. And she just found all kinds of uh, good stuff. Went to sites we suggested, found sites on her own. She found a bunch of rare plant records that we didn't know about. Um, her, her input was really valuable to us. She's a great partner as well. And then these hey, days, yeah. I uh, just wanted to say, I know we build it for two hours, but feel free to talk as long as you'd like. I mean, if you want to go over some stuff, um, people can always decide to log off if they want to, but um, we're not limited to two hours if you need a little bit more time. Well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just run out the clock and I'll keep going. Yeah. Um, I got more, more pictures and, and now it is a native plant society. We just get, <laughs> yeah, don't feel like you got to rush it. I mean, I think okay. uh, I know myself, I'm enjoying this and I'm sure others are as well. So uh, we okay. can make it three hours long if we want to. Well, we'll see. I may have to run the rest of them at some point, <laughs> but I'll go. I'll go as far as I can here. Here's um, priority. Yeah, priority sites. So, again, you know, this is sort of an outcome of the information in the report. Um, you know, this is this is something that's never done, and it's a changing. You know, we learn new things all the time. Um, even though this was a well-funded project. You know, we, we really only scratched the surface and we could get out and do a lot more field work in the future. We could, we'll get better maps, better models, better tools. We'll learn more through iNaturalist from all the contributors to the volunteer project. Um, you know, but we know already there are certain areas that have a disproportionate share of remaining biodiversity. And a lot of these are at these ecoregion boundaries. They're in the parts of the Springfield Plateau that haven't been all developed or converted. The Springfield Plateau, these savannas, these prairies, that's really the top thing we can do, I think, in terms of it's challenging because there's a restoration component to it. There's almost nothing left in good condition, but the, a lot of the parts are still present. And we know from places like Woolsey Prairie, Fayetteville, City of Fayetteville is restored, that incredible restorations can happen on some of these sites. And um, there's areas where you have these ecoregion boundaries like this one, where you've got these Monadnocks or these Boston Mountain remnants on the surface of the plateau, where you can, and the, the mountains are in pretty good shape, a lot of them, like this is Kessler Mountain at the northern end of this. And a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, I did a big assessment of it in 2004 and five, or 14 and 15 and uh, was impressed with, with the quality of it. And 
the city of Fayetteville now has a big chunk of it as a preserve. Um, it's an excellent site, but there's a whole chain of these ridges that run down to Prairie Grove and, and beyond into the, into the heart of the Bostons. And some of those are likely even much higher quality. Uh, they have less intense disturbance history. Uh, one of them has a wetland on the top that may be very rare. Um, but if you protect just the mountain, you're only getting a piece of the, of the total puzzle. If you spread that out and include the fringe of the valleys along the chain of mountains and get those former prairie and savanna areas, restore those, you're really doubling the, the value for conservation. Uh, part of the specimen digitization. Oh, I guess the point I was gonna show there, I don't know what I was gonna show. I was gonna show that the rare species that we knew about, um, Kessler had been studied in the past. Botanists had been collecting there since the 1920s, but um, we found tons of things that none of them had ever seen or never, never collected anyway. And uh, we relocated one plant called uh, Missouri ground cherry, which was last seen in Arkansas in the 1950s before it was found at Kessler. And it was known from Kessler um, from the 1930s, I believe. And uh, that was just really neat to, to find that there. And you know, that's, that's become an area of interest in the Natural Heritage Commission. Uh, we didn't really know what, all of the neat things that were in that chain of hills. And, and now we have a much better perspective on it. Uh, we did a, the digitization on CERNEC. There's now something like 13,000 specimens of plants from Benton, Washington County that have been digitized. And a lot of these we didn't know about. So we knew about the specimens that were in Arkansas or collections like at the U of A or at, um, you know, wherever, Natural Heritage or University of Central Arkansas or Barium or wherever they were. But there were 10,000 specimens or something from Arkansas that were in hundreds of other collections around the country. And until this digitization effort happened over the last 10 years or so, and really over the last six years, we had no idea any of these specimens even existed or most of them. And so we found some great surprises like this is Trelisa's larkspur, that globally rare species that we only know today from the White River Hills, but this was collected south of Fayetteville in the Boston Mountains on a limestone outcrop in the 1920s. We had no idea about it. Uh, this is a rare tree or it's really a shrub called um, prickly ash, American prickly ash. Um, I don't know of any sites for this in Northwest Arkansas today, but we, we found some historical specimens that yeah, at least tell us where it could be or that it was here historically. It's probably still around. Uh, maybe one of you can find it. Um, we didn't know this species was in Northwest Arkansas at all. And I think this is known only from historical records in Arkansas, period. Uh, kind of a Western species, but there's a specimen of it from Washington County near Farmington, 1925, new to us. A rare lily, the Eastern feather bells. It was known from Benton County, but we found a specimen from Washington County. It's kind of cool. No, rec uh, no records in Washington County today, I think. I think it has been found. Um, I think Cheryl Hall and Samantha Heller maybe both found it at um, Lake Atalanta in uh, Benton County. That was a good find. Here's a big surprise. This orchid, this is a little plant called the, the green wood orchid. And this species is not rare enough that we would track it at Heritage because it's common in the southern Washita's and the coastal plain and groundwater seeps. But we had zero records from Northwest Arkansas anywhere. And I saw this in a search of the digitized specimens and I immediately thought, oh, that's a mis ID. And somebody, somebody made a mistake or, or they typed the wrong label in or something. No, it's for real, 1886 collection from Fayetteville. This would have been in some kind of acidic groundwater fed wetland. And uh, I mean, that would be amazing to find that today up there in that part of the world. Um, wasn't even on our radar, but because of the digitization of the specimens, we were able to, to get it on our radar. I already talked about this one. Um, this is that uh, trail in Ratney. Uh, gotta be in Arkansas. I mean, it's in a remnant habitat of it's an ancient relic from drier climatic periods 
when all of these Western sort of dry arid grassland species moved east. And we find other species from its main range in our glades. We've never seen this one, but it's probably around. So it'd be a great one to find in modern day. Again, this is from the 1920s. Here's the specimen, Wooded Hills, west of Fayetteville, 1925. Here is uh, not rare at all, but this is just interesting. There was, there's a lot of overlap between the science and the history of a lot of this stuff. And this specimen is from the 1800s. This was collected by uh, Dr. Harvey, or I don't know if he's a doctor actually, but uh, Harvey was, this is Francis Harvey. He was the, he taught botany at the U of A in the 1870s and 80s. And uh, this is not how you mount a specimen, by the way, over the label, but it says, I think, it says low ground, Washington County, Arkansas. Judge Greg's Meadow. And so I said, well, I bet Judge Greg is who Greg Avenue was named after in Fayetteville. And I bet I can find information on him. And sure enough, he was a very prominent uh, citizen at that time. And this was his house, I guess, but he had a meadow somewhere that had that sedge in it. I thought it was kind of just cool. This is globally extremely rare, has a rank of G2, which is globally imperiled. Um, it is no longer known from Northwest Arkansas. Um, it is called small headed pipewort. And it was found historically, this would have been in either a, a seasonally wet groundwater fed sandstone glade or a extremely rare type of grassland called a seepage prairie where acidic groundwater seeps out of the toe of a slope in a prairie. We know of two examples of this habitat in Arkansas today. They're both in the Arkansas Valley in Franklin County, and they both have this plant in abundance. Uh, but apparently it was in Northwest Arkansas historically, the specimen from 1885, again from Harvey, springy places on the prairie near Siloam Springs. We have looked for this in the two remaining high quality prairies we have found some seasonally wet spots, but we've not found the plant, but that doesn't mean it's not there or might pop out of the seed bank or in a good year or whatever. Um, but it could sure be in even a small remnant roadside seepage prairie. Uh, definitely one to look for. We know there were seepage prairies at Rogers. There's a bunch of other seepage prairie plants from the 1950s from near the ball field complex there, south of Searles Prairie, if you know where that is, uh, along where the new Northwest Arkansas Trail runs through there. The, if you were to work, work the areas along that trail, look for little wet areas in the former prairie there, you might turn up all kinds of good stuff. Uh, another really rare species that turned up, um, we had no records, this is a really cool story, we had no records of this from Northwest Arkansas. This is the lowland yellow loose stripe, it is known only from natural depression pond wetlands in our part of the world. We have, I think we had four records of this in Arkansas, all in sinkhole ponds, natural depression ponds where caves had collapsed historically. Um, but to the Eastern part, east of Northwest Arkansas, like in the Eastern parts of the Ozarks. And that was all the records we had for it. And this specimen turned up, we had no idea it existed. This is at the New York Botanical Garden. And we found a treasure trove of hundreds of specimens collected in 1899 um, by a guy named Elisha or Alicia Plank. And uh, I'll show you him in a second, but um, this specimen turned up in these hundreds of specimens that, that are at the New York Botanical Garden that we had no idea existed. And we also had one of our iNaturalist projects turn, turned it up. Somebody found it in Washington County in what must be a little depression wetland or flat uh, on the Springfield Plateau. And it just, they posted it on here um, as a different species, which is much more common than anybody would have thought that's what it was. And I looked at I think tens of thousands of these iNaturalist observations of plants as part of this work, as we were working on the plant list. And um, 
I just flipped out because I, I, I knew this plant because I'd done surveys for it when I was the botanist here years ago. And uh, sure enough, I said, that's definitely it. And, uh, you know, now we, we got to see, these are the four records we had, the four sinkhole pond sites. And then this is the site where the iNaturalist observation was from. And then the Benton County one, all it says on the label, as was, you know, all they thought about, I guess, back in the 1800s, it just says Benton County, Arkansas. So we don't know where the heck it was, somewhere in Benton County. Um, anyway, one to look for in depression wetlands, probably on the Springfield Plateau, or on top of one of those Boston Mountains, Monadnox, in a little um, depression fall. Uh, this one wasn't known for Northwest Arkansas. This is a smooth scouring rush. There's a much more common species of scouring rush, which is you know common uh, everywhere. Uh, but this one is a really rare one. And it was found, uh, we have two records of it that we didn't know existed. This one is um, on the north bank of a creek, tributary of the White River. We believe this is now under, lake, um, under Beaver Lake. And then there was another one that was definitely under Beaver Lake. Uh, it was at Martin Bluff, which not only is the area under the bluff, which is where it would have been uh, gone, but the whole bluff is now pretty much underwater when the lake's high. Uh, so that area is gone. Um, just here's a few of the, I guess the, you'd say the prominent collectors or the, the significant collectors, once people who made a lot of collections or important collections or real early collections from the area. So this is that Engelman specimen I talked about before, um, Nuttall's Milk Vetch. This was made in 1835. It's one of the earliest collections. He found it uh, Northwest Arkansas. And you're from, he was on a trip from Cane Hill to Fort Gibson um, on damp prairies. And that's the specimen there. The specimen actually has two, it's from two different places. There's, but one of the specimens is the one from Northwest Arkansas. Um, there's Harvey. With some one of his one of his great finds. This is a really rare plant called earleaf false foxglove. It's globally rare. It's only found in very high quality grasslands, uh, usually high pH. And it's found. It's a what they call a hemiparasite. So it's partially it's green, and it photosynthesizes, but it also is a partial parasite. So it attaches to host a host plant. And when you see big plants of this that are flowering and have a lot of fruit or whatever, they're likely attached to the host. And um, he collected this in the 1800s up there, Northwest Arkansas prairies. Um, yeah, pretty neat. Um, specimens from this guy, Buckholtz. Uh, this is a rare one. This is the oh, um, Royal Catchfly, Silene uh, regia, which is a prairie thing, prairies and savannas. And uh, he found this up there somewhere. I can't see the label very good. Um, Harvey, I mean, uh, not Harvey, Palmer, uh, was a real prolific collector. He found a ton of really important things in Northwest Arkansas. He lived near Joplin, Missouri, and he worked for the Arnold Arboretum, which is Harvard University's big arboretum in Massachusetts, but he was based in Missouri. And he collected extensively <coughs> in Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, and he found some really great uh, things, including this very rare hawthorn, this is the Kansas hawthorn, Crotigus coccinioides, which was only recently rediscovered in Arkansas, and it was in Pope County. But this specimen, uh, it, we, we have specimens uh, from Benton and Washington counties. So this is one to look for. Uh, this is Benjamin Franklin Bush. Um, he was a prominent collector here. Supposedly, this photo is him and his wife on their anniversary in a giant field of cactus. Well, that's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, he's also well known for his incredible mustache. And this is a not a rare plant, but this is the uh, Florida um, sugar maple, uh, Acer uh, floridanum or Barbatum, which is known from Northwest Arkansas. And that's, yeah, that's where that's from. Um, and then this uh, colorful character is Delzy Demery. He's a, a famous Arkansas botanist collected over a really long period from the 1920s to the 1980s. Um, and did a lot of collecting in Northwest Arkansas. Well, this is some cool pictures of him with his, with his plant press there and his rifle. And that he's, I think he's the one who first found the black maple of the devil's eyebrow. And that's what that specimen is. 
Uh, Dr. Moore, Dwight Moore, was a botanist at the U of A, Fayetteville. Um, had a long career. He also collected from the 20s, I think up until the, at least the 70s maybe. And he, um, this is a rare lead plant, Amorpha canescens that he collected. Um, Ali Simmons was uh, a student at the U of A and made some pretty important collections as well. Uh, this is a picture of her at the, in the Chi Omega sorority, I guess the yearbook picture, and uh, some important plant collections that she made. She was also an incredible illustrator. Um, I don't know if Jennifer Ogle found these or if I came across them, but they were uh, illustration, scientific illustrations of grasshoppers that she made. It was really cool. Maxine Height was a school teacher in Southern Washington County in the Cove Creek Valley. She did a lot of collecting down there and had some real important uh, collections from the Boston Mountains at the U of A. Uh, there's Elisha Plank. And uh, this is from a, a memoriam article uh, that was written by that guy Buckholtz that we saw a minute ago. And he's the, this is the guy who collected all the stuff in, in uh, 1899 time period from Benton County. And this is one of his specimens here. This was a this was a big range extension. This is another one where I first saw the digital record and thought, I better have to check that out because that sounds like a miss ID. This is in Blackland, uh, Limey Prairies in southwest Arkansas, Texas. See it in the coastal plain several times. Never seen it anywhere near northwest Arkansas. But I uh, checked out the specimen and it's 100% what it is. You know, there's a lot of interesting coastal plain species that were disjunct or you know removed from the main range in the coastal plain specifically a lot of coastal plain species in the grasslands especially savannas prairies and, and groundwater fed areas uh, in northwest arkansas very clear pattern of coastal plain influence and plant migration between that ecoregion uh, and the grasslands specifically in Arkansas Valley and the Ozarks. And even up in the Great Lakes, it's kind of a, an interesting biogeographical pattern. Um, there's some species that were described from Benton and Washington County. And, and if you're familiar with that level of, of documentation, for every time you describe a species, there's something called a type specimen. And the type specimen is the specimen that the species description is based on. And these two things were actually described as new species at one time, but they were later um, determined to be the same as an already described species. But this one on the left is, uh, was Aster subsessilis. Uh, it's the type specimen, I think it's from Benton County. And, uh, you know, it's now considered Sympiotrum patens, uh, or Aster patens, which is the fall or late, late purple aster, whatever the common name is. Uh, solid ego pendula was described for Northwest Ar Arkansas. It's now considered solid ego radula. Uh, Rincospera planchii. Um, this is kind of interesting. So two of the people I just showed pictures of, this was named after Planck, I think by Harvey. And anyway, it was named after Planck as a new species. Somebody else, figured out it was actually the same as Rincospera harvii, which was named after Harvey. So um, that's neat. And that's not a common species. It's not quite rare enough to track, uh, but it is known from glades and kind of well-drained sites and prairies, remnant, remnant grasslands uh, in Northwest Arkansas. And then this thing, uh, Capnoides campestri is, was described, turns out it's Corylus micrantha subspecies australis. Um, which is not a rare species, but interesting. Um, two other species described in Northwest Arkansas that sort of didn't end up being different. You know, there's a lot of things that were described in the old days when we didn't have a lot of good botanical references that people thought were new because, you know, just, there wasn't the level of information out there today that, that there is to, to do things. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'll dwell on these, I'll go on, but this one was described from Northwest Arkansas and is still regarded as legit. And this is the, uh, I talked about it briefly before, but this is the uh, 
and that was supposed to be animated, and it didn't work. Um, the type specimens underneath the label. But this is the Arkansas alum root. And there's some interesting, with the type specimens, some interesting correspondence between botanists um, at the time it was described, experts that are studying this group at Harvard and other places. Uh, and it was just a, a fun thing to go through and, and study all that. Here's a note from, uh, to tip the screen to see this note from Dr. Robinson at at uh, oh this is someone writing it on Dr. Robinson's behalf to uh, J.K. Small, who's a very famous botanist of the time at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, says Dr. Robins Robinson has asked me to send you the enclosed fragments of Hookera arkansana. Here's truly Mary Day. And uh, here's Robinson's note that was to Dr. Small with it. Kind of rough to read, but somebody transcribed it. Dr. Small, I have examined the Blankenship specimen of H for Hookera arkansana. I think there can be no doubt, whatever, that it is a species entirely distinct from your Hookera macrorhiza. The toothing of the leaves is by no means so fine, and the stem is more slender than in H. macrorhiza. It, it is in habit, to, in habit much closer to H. velosa, from which it differs chiefly in having a much narrower, more crowded inflorescence. And that is held up. It is considered a variety by most people of um, Hookera velosa, uh, but is found only in the Ozarks and and Washington's and nowhere else. And this is from the type. And there was a neat, uh, someone had done a tracing of the type and it was mounted by itself in a different institution, but they had obviously borrowed the type specimen or had uh, gone to the institution where it was and traced it over on tracing paper. And I laid them over digitally and matched them up. So it was cool. Um, and where that is, where that was the type locality is from I'm almost positive, is from these one of these monadnocks of the Bostons. There's Price Mountain, Weber Mountain, and Fitzgerald Mountain, all there in the Springfield Plateau, just east of Springdale. And if you look at those on the LIDAR, well, there they are in the aerial. So you can see they're really prominent features. And they're different geology. They're the geology of the Boston Mountains. And they have cliffs of that same sandstone that's common in the Bostons which has this species often. And there's the LIDAR and you can see the cliff line, big chunks of rock broken off. And that's probably where those 1890s collections were made. And there's another specimen from there. And this one's definitely from Weber Mountain, but it's not the type. This is from 1923, collected by Buckholz. And then our volunteers have turned up tons of great stuff, Cheryl Hall, uh, up at Bella Vista, sent this early in the project. This was a great um, find of a very rare plant, Nabalus albus or Prenanthes alba, the white rattlesnake root, which is a northern species that's disjunct in the Mesic woodlands in northern Benton County. And uh, that was really neat. Uh, she, I think she found it in her yard, in her backyard in Bella Vista. There's a few other records that have turned up. Joan Reynolds sent specimens in. Um, it's around, but it's it's of conservation concern for sure. So lots of great new records. That's the Prenanthes alba, uh, the rattlesnake root. Northern species jumps down here. And interestingly, all four of these counties, the Stone, and then these ones in the River Valley, those were all misidentified. So it's really in a tight area up here in Benton Carroll County and maybe over in Marion County. And that's, as far as I know, all the Arkansas localities. A um, couple other interesting ones. Um, Jesse Scarborough found this. This is not a good find, unfortunately, or not good news anyway. Um, this is an invasive from the Gulf Coast, uh, Baccarus helimifolia, the salt bush. I think I found it new to Washington County down near um, Lincoln and uh, turned it up here in, a prairie, in Benton County. Uh, this is one that's probably, maybe you've seen it in Northwest Arkansas. It's 
definitely spreading north and can be quite invasive, especially in seasonally wet grassland. Um, and that's the known distribution of that one a while back, but it is now all the way to Benton County. And I think it's even been seen in Missouri. So marching north, they map it as green here as native because it is native on the Gulf Coast and possibly at a few sites in inland salt areas. It's a very salt tolerant species. And one of the ways it's spreading is along um, areas where they salt the roads in the winter and also in agricultural fields where fertilizer salts accumulate in the soil over time with evaporation. There's been some interesting, uh, I guess, study, study of that. Uh, but it is moving north along road ditches, especially. It likes its feet kind of moist, uh, one to look for. It's our only woody plant in the sunflower family in Arkansas. A couple other interesting things. This is not a native plant. It's uh, not, not invasive really either. This is the uh, safflower. And, but it's turning up regularly now. And it's coming from birdseed mixes. It's what we call a birdseed waif. So it is safflower seeds are in birdseed, uh, but they spread beyond the feeders. And it's kind of becoming a semi-regular part of the flora. Um, maybe it'll reproduce and spread. Maybe it'll always just sort of uh, be a short-term thing, but it was kind of interesting. It wasn't known from the county. Um, you know, it's beginning to be documented, but not, not a lot of records yet. Uh, this one was interesting. Uh, it's now in the genus Ranunculus, the buttercups. Uh, and this iNaturalist has it as Serratocephala testiculata, the curved seed butterwort. And apparently it's known to spread in camp, campsites, like campers and things, like uh, RVs, I guess. Um, I read some interesting things about that. And this was a campsite up on Beaver Lake. And uh, it was a new record for Arkansas. This wasn't known at all from here. And that turned up on the iNaturalist project. Uh, that was the range, I guess, as of 2014. Um, Samantha Heller turned up this gem. This is uh, Echinacea simulata. So everyone knows Echinacea pallida, which is the common you know, pale purple coneflower. Uh, this is a much rarer species that's confined to dolomite grasslands in Arkansas. And... Uh, I expected this for years and looked for it. I thought I'd maybe found it at Devil's Eyebrow in glades there, but they turned out to be Echinacea pallida, which is you know not common really either, but it's, it's much more common than this species. But this one definitely checked out. Um, it's different in several ways. It has most noticeably, if you catch it at the right time, it has um, yellow, like orange yellow pollen, like kind of a deep, yellow school bus yellow pollen and the pale purple cone flower has almost white pollen uh, this one also has a stem that flares out as you get near the tip uh, of the flower head like below the flower head it kind of really flares out and is often darker in color almost purplish and then the um, the ray petals the you know the showy part of the flowers um, are typically shorter than the pale purple um, and often have a, more of a deeper pink color. This one, not so much, but uh, it was a great find. It's, it's almost like a watch list kind of a thing. It's not on the rare species list, but it's, it's declining big time because the habitat's declining. Uh, that was a great find over on Beaver Lake, White River Hills. Um, yeah, there, so that wasn't known from Northwest Arkansas proper. It was in Carroll County, but not in Benton. Um, Nate Weston turned this up, American Beach. Um, you know, rare to have a big tree not known from a county as well botanized as Benton County, which immediately sort of got people thinking, people thinking or wondering, is this a remnant native thing or is this something that's spreading from cultivation into good habitat, uh, you know, that's, that's right for it. And I think Nate kind of indicated he thought that might be the case, that there were no big ones, but they were definitely naturalized along these hollows uh, near Lake Atalanta. And I think there's been another a site found. I would expect it in the upper Boston mountains in the extreme southeast Benton, or Washington County as a native element in deep canyons, because it's definitely over in Newton County, parts of Madison County as a natural, you know, relics, uh, probably ice age thing that got stranded in those canyons. 
Um, but yeah, sort of verdicts out on Benton County. It's in Mesic Forest, but with other Mesic Forest natives, but not, not really sure it's native there. Um, yeah, so there it shows kind of the other Boston Mountain sites. And this one was interesting. This is a, a sunflower called the willow leaf sunflower that we've been expecting to find in Arkansas for many years. Um, I thought I'd found it once at Chesney Prairie in Benton County, but that was the narrow leaf sunflower, which is superficially similar or a coastal plain thing that sort of at the northern end of its range up there. This would be sort of coming down from the Great Plains from the west um, into Benton County. It's not known from Arkansas. So I got real excited about that one and I got in touch with Cheryl Hall. This is up at Bella Vista. And uh, I got in touch with Cheryl and she's always willing to do some volunteer botany for us. And she went and checked it out. And it sounds like it's part of a, a meadow that was planted with a wildflower mix, prairie mix or something. Um, skeptical that it's natural there. So I think we're uh, not, you know, we're not, we're not gonna include that in the flora at this time, but it, um, it's one to look for, for sure, because check out the range. That's, it's, a, you know, it's globally pretty rare. It's a tight range centered on Southeast Kansas. And it ought to be in Benton County, Washington County, but it's just the context of it was suspicious, you know, uh, hard to say. Sometimes we don't know about the native status of stuff. Uh, there was some invasives, of course, new invasives. That's always, always finding new invasives. This is a nasty yellow iris, uh, beautiful, but super aggressive. And that's, you know, popping up all over the place and sort of urban wetlands uh, coming soon to one near you, if not already there. Um, but that wasn't known for Benton County. It is now. Uh, I found, unfortunately, a, a new privet for the state. Uh, it's now been found in Benton and Washington County. This is the border privet, like Gustrum obtusifolium. I think several other people have picked it up since. I found it first at um, Wilson Springs Preserve in Washington County, and then I found it on the city of Fayetteville property down by that west, west side water treatment plant in the woods down there. So that's one, you know, we have actually several different privets. Um, Jennifer Ogle and I gave a key, I think, in the tree book, Trees and Shrubs book, uh, if you want to know more. But um, it's not all Chinese privet, but this one's invasive as well. And that was new for the state. Uh, Karen Willard turned up a gem, sort of. Um, this is a, another, I guess, invasive, but it wasn't known from, from the area. This is the brittle. Niad, Nias Minor. And uh, that wasn't known anywhere around Northwest Arkansas. And she picked that up for us. And then this one turned up on iNaturalist and I got really interested in this one. This is a uh, potential invasive uh, horticultural thing. Uh, also turned up in Bella Vista on iNaturalist. A little fuzzy on the details, but I think uh, Cheryl went and looked for it and didn't find it. So we kind of we're worried it was maybe becoming invasive. If I'm wrong, Cheryl, you'll have to tell me, but I, that's my memory of this, this one. And then somebody found the devil's claw, which is kind of cool. This is a Southwestern desert species. It is native in the East, but it's uncommon. And they found it in like a kind of a, a limestone gravel lot. Um, you know, hard to say if it's natural or not. It was apparently near the site of a former nursery. Um, it has a really interesting seed pod, which unfortunately I don't have a picture of, but pretty neat. Yeah, more of a Western thing. Uh, this one's been turning up. I'm just kind of showing you some stuff that turned up in the survey. This is another non-native that's becoming found a lot of places. This is chia. If you've ever had a chia pet or ate chia seeds, this is the plan. It's a, it's a mint and uh, the seeds are you know, supposedly have a lot of health benefits and uh, it's a beautiful plant, very showy. It's a salvia, uh, sage, and uh, that's turned up a few spots uh, around. Really just beginning to take over and or become naturalized. I won't say take over, but uh, there's some only known on Biota of North America map from three states. Um, that's it.
I'm going to end on this beautiful prairie. Be happy to answer questions for a little long if anybody wants to. Yeah, thank you, Leo. We, uh, Theo, sorry, not Leo. Uh, Leo is my new nephew's name. Um, yeah, wow, that was wonderful, amazing. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you giving us just about an extra hour. Um, I have been keeping log of some uh, questions that are in have been put in the chat. So I would like to kind of read a couple of those to you here. Uh, Patrick Yang asks, will this report be available for purchase or download? And if so, how can we be alerted to when it's available? It'll be available for download. It will, will not be charged for in digital format for sure. Okay. Uh, draft reports due to the funder next month. There may be some revisions after that. I expect it to be out this year released. Um, but, you know, other people have a say in that. And if it is published in hard copy, I hope, I hope that's something that will be considered. <clears throat> that will depend on probably additional funding or partners that want to do that. I think it would be widely used uh, and people would enjoy reading it. We really did try to make it accessible to sort of the lay public, you know, interested people, not necessarily professional scientists. Yeah, I hope it. Awesome. Yeah, we're looking good. forward to when that's going to be yeah, put out. I mean, Native Plant Society will 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 get word of when that happens, and it will be, it will be, uh, you can broadcast it. Uh, it's um, another question that was asked: What is the purpose of the little color search on some of the records that was posted uh, a little while back? So you might know what they're referring to. Color search. I don't know if that was on the CERNIC or the iNaturalist records, or no, the BONAP records, maybe native status, uh, green. Uh, yeah. yeah, the green's a native, um, orange is historical, blue is non-native. If it was that, if it was color status in the plant list or the species lists in the report, um, they're coded, there's different colors based on conservation concern potential concern, invasive. Um, there's a lead, there'll be a legend in the report. If there's some other color code, I'm not remembering, I apologize, but. Um, that was, I think, Becca Cavanaugh that had asked that, and I think she may have logged off. So okay, if I didn't answer the question, she's welcome to contact me and I'll figure it out. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, what elements slash resources are available statewide for individual counties? Um, not very many. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, there's some of the layers like, um, you know, the glade shape file is available statewide. Um, the, the, we did the prairies for the whole state. So when I did the GLO prairies, um, those are actually done by someone a few years ago, this guy, John Barone, he digitized them, but there was some kind of error or problem in the, if you know, if you use GIS in the projection and it, they never lined up right, uh, in Arkansas and no one could figure out how to fix it. And so we had two interns that, that we had remap all the, the prairies on those GLO plants. And it was many months of, or several months of work, but that's available um, as well. I don't know exactly offhand where to get that stuff, but if somebody wants to contact me, um, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to uh, direct you to it. But the Glade map and the historical prairie map statewide. And of course, there's like, you know, not a lot of glades in South Arkansas. So, you know, it's just where they, where they occur. And then um, some of the, like that, that all those new MORAP maps that I showed, that stuff will be available statewide in about a year. Uh, that's ongoing work right now. Okay. And uh, it may be before a year. It's, they're working on it. They did Benton, Washington County products for me first um, as part of the, it was funded as part of this project. Um, yeah. But that, that will be available. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, sorry. I had a question about that though, before you're done. The LIDAR is everybody's favorite. That's the revolutionary, you know, ground surface uh, representation. And that is, um, that's available statewide and it's not just GIS format. Now you can get on Google earth. And so anybody, you know, a lot of people use Google earth. It's free. Um, you can get that LIDAR, but I got to warn you, when you get it, you're going to be up all night. 
um, the the MoRap. Uh, that's the soils thing, if I'm not mistaken. If I remember, right? Uh, they they had a soils component, but it was okay. The, okay, it's going to be a, a a modern day existing land cover vegetation. Okay, um, and it but it includes several components. Like they, that was made using several of those other layers, right? So they have the um, solar radiation model, the topographic wetness index, the soils model, soil vegetation model. And there's three or four other ones that they use that just weren't super useful for this. You know what I mean? So I didn't show those, but uh, and also I was trying to get two hours to see how well I did. But um, yeah, so some of those products are available. The aerial imagery is all statewide, Tobo map, you know, but, but some of the stuff is, you know, specific things we mapped only for these counties. Uh, so they're not going to be statewide. Okay. Yeah. But we do hope to make, we do hope to make all the GIS products available. Oh, nice. You know, it's, yeah. Important. Yeah. I know um, you know, talked about mapping the the soil units for the counties, uh, trying to get something, I guess, more refined than what NRCS has. Um, I didn't know if y'all had worked with the University of Arkansas soil department. Uh, I know there, Christopher Bry, Dr. Bry, he had, he had written a book uh, maybe about 10 years ago on the soils of Arkansas and on different soil series that are, found throughout the state, uh, but kind of divided it up by the different level, I guess it'd be level one ecoregions. But um, anyway, I have, not, great I have for not, not seen that. I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, I think only I mean, a limited number of hard copies are published. And I've, unfortunately, I don't think they came out with the second edition. So much to digitize that. Um, yeah. The soils, you know, if anything, the NRCS map is so detailed. I mean, there's two versions, right? There's one called the Sergo, which is real detailed. There's one called the Statsco, which is associations, like eight types from the counties. Mm -hmm. And that one's too coarse to really, you know, get down to the community level. Mm -hmm. But the other one's so, so detailed that it's, you know, it's really useful for a small area. But, wow, when you try to look at a whole county, it's that wild psychedelic map I showed you. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So it's more than, you can, more than you can process. A lot of granularity to look at on a large scale like that. Uh, Molly was just commenting on that, um, that question from Becca Cavanaugh about the uh, color codes. And Molly says, I think she meant the color bar on specimens and says that they're intended to allow people who use specimen images to color correct them. Yeah, right. Okay, thanks, Molly. You're absolutely right. I, that must be what she meant. Yeah, so that is, um, yeah, I don't know anyone who actually uses that, but I know that those little color things, they're like, an inch by an inch and they cost like 200 bucks so, i don't know why they're so expensive but we we got one here and it was uh for the for the digitizing but yeah it's for color correcting yeah my wife uses that she's a digital photographer and so um if she's editing photos taking photos and has to make sure they print out and not be like red shifted or green shifted she has to calibrate her camera calibrate her screen and it's just yeah, it really makes you realize that just because you're seeing one color on your computer screen doesn't mean that's the true color of what you're looking at. Um, oh, yeah, I guess uh, somebody else commented that Becca Cavanaugh had corrected her question to say uh, search was supposed to mean swatch, uh, referring to the Pantene oh, color yeah, scale yeah. on the digitized specimens. All right, yeah, sounds like we got the answer. Great. Gotcha. All right, um, any other, I think that's all that I've recorded from the chat is if anyone else has any questions feel free to put it in the chat or unmute your mic um hopefully we don't have too much chaos if everyone unmutes their mic at once anybody still sticking around we still have like 37 people in it's about half so these are the hardcore people that are really into what you're talking about uh, besides questions, I mean, you got a lot of great comments, just uh, people just very thankful for the work you've done and very impressed by, you know, how great it is. And, you know, that, yeah, so Corey Roberts says, thanks so much. Great work. And Dan Scheiman uh, had quite a bit of positive things to say about the work you're doing. Well, both of them did a good work, too. Yeah. All right. Well, um, nobody has any other questions. I guess we will wrap it up and that wraps it up for the currently scheduled uh webinars for 2023 hope you'll check back in with us for uh, a new series of webinars that we'll have likely in 2024 plan to continue to do these each year so uh, if you have uh, reached out and requested to be on the uh, email list and you are already on the email list but if you're not 
then please email me at ansprograms at gmail.com to get on that list. That way you can be informed uh, when our webinars are coming up and you can get the Zoom links so that you can uh, view those. I want to thank everyone for being here with us today. I really want to thank Theo Witzel for donating his time uh, and for actually giving us 150% of what he had originally agreed to. So thank you, Theo. Uh, I think anytime uh, you're sharing your expertise with us, it's uh, very much appreciated. And we all have so much to learn. I know I learned a lot today. Um, again, the recording will be placed or uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So please check that out. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, webinars on there from the past uh, several years that you can go back and check out uh, to do with all kinds of things related to the native flora of the natural state. Now you can find out more information about the Arkansas Native Plant Society on our website, amps.org. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. Uh, and again, join by going to amps.org slash join, where you can use your PayPal account to join uh, right now or today or whenever uh, you would like. So. Again, thank you, everybody, and hope everyone uh, stays cool out there and has a great weekend. Thank you, Theo. Thank you. Bye.